Yeah. Yeah. I think we will get started. Um, I'm going to turn on my video briefly, but I have a terribly unstable connection myself. So I will probably turn it back off. And I actually look better in the photo than I do in real life. Well, I will mute myself just for the transmission if I'm not. Your countdown clock to New Year's? No. Those of you who are anticipating a holiday, no. What well, we're setting our count to be able to launch the rare disease drug program. And I just want to give early notice to many of you, all things going well, well, or at least no worse than they are now we would hope to have an in-person or at least a hybrid conference at the beginning of April to really launch our um, rare disease drug program. So we're going to use our first uh, meetings here this December to really talk about what we need to do to build it. And I think as Cheryl was saying pre previously before everybody came on, many of you have joined us before you will pretty much know what you might anticipate, but hopefully you'll get some additional insights. Um, so this is, would be a two-day, three-hour conference. I lost so, you there, Duran. Next year. Yeah, Durhan is pretty choppy. Absolutely here too. Yeah, we can't. Uh, she's cut out. Yeah. So while we're waiting for Durhan, I'll I'll quickly uh, go through a couple of logistical issues in the hopes that she'll be able to make it back on with um, a stronger connection shortly. Um, my name is Bill Dempster with 360 Public Affairs and, and longtime partner and collaborator uh, on rare disease issues and working with CORD. Um, it's great to see so many friendly faces out there. Um, some of you back in, uh, as, as Dr. Greenberg is, is traveling uh, in an airport, I see others yeah. in, in offices again, which is, which is uh, nice to see life starting to get back to normal. Um, and so just a couple logistical things while we wait for Durhan. Uh, try to keep your microphone on mute uh, if you can, uh, but feel free to participate, put your hand up, Use the chat group. Uh, this will be similar to the, the town hall discussions and webinars that, that uh, CORD has been running in the past few months where we're really encouraging a lot of participation. Um, this will be short on actual presentations where we're gonna be showing a lot of slides. It's going to be uh, a lot more about the discussion on key themes uh, that Durhan has set up. Um, it is being recorded, uh, and this is the build opportunity, uh, recognizing that we have until April 1st next year to really uh, put a lot in the window for the federal government, for the provincial governments, and in fact, for everyone across the rare diseases community. Because as you've heard um, Cord and Durhan and, and, and folks say who have helped build Canada's rare disease strategy in 2015, it's not a strategy that's just for the federal government. It's a strategy for everyone on this call as well, uh, which includes uh, clinicians, researchers, industry, uh, health system leaders, uh, and of course, patients and the community themselves who, who are really at the head of that parade. So uh, Durhan, let's test your audio again. I know you're off video now, but uh, I, I did logistics and a, and a quick mini setup, I think. I think I'm going to be very unstable here. Can we just jump to, if we can hear me, we'll go to just my wanting to introduce the UN resolution. Yeah, we're there. Um, so, oh, sorry. Just, yeah, we're there. Okay, so we've kind of gone through that. Just to say quickly, I wanted to announce the fact that as of 15th of November, the United Nations has adopted through the third committee a resolution on per, for persons living with rare diseases and their families. This is a really, really big deal because it puts rare diseases 
at the center of all of the sustainable development goals. Next slide. So this is the draft resolution. It has to be passed in December to become final. And it's really more of an overarching set of principles, but it does recognize that people living with rare diseases are not just living with healthcare conditions, but are also subject to social, economic, educational, and other disparities. Next slide. It really allows us to bring in all of the United Nations, the WHO, UNICEF, UNESCO, the World Bank, to help us address the challenges of rare diseases worldwide and provide a context for all countries to really adopt programs and plans for rare diseases. Next slide. So these are the key areas that we have addressed, the human rights, so that health is not only a human right, but also persons living with rare diseases have access to and deserve those same rights. And it will allow us to be able to match and to map the progress that rare diseases is making in each country against the other kinds of healthcare benefits, but also against a global context. Appropriate care, so it's not just about treatment, but it's also about care and support. National action, because we recognize, as Canada is doing now, that there needs to be national integration, but more than just drugs more than just you know diagnosis also in terms of the social economic and the um, educational human rights perspectives inclusion in the un system we already have some really exciting opportunities that the various um, uh, entities within the un have actually addressed one of the things we're really looking at is the potential for a fund under the world bank to actually be able to address disparities in terms of rare diseases. This puts rare diseases right at the heart of assuring that we're gonna be able to support all of those who are living with diseases that affect small patient populations and then to monitor progress. Next slide. This is only here for you to look at and to look at the specifics that we're doing, just to say Canada is right in the heart of it. The things that we're doing in the rare disease strategy are going to help us in terms of being able to address all of these rights and beyond, obviously, just the drugs that we're doing. Next slide. So here are the opportunities for implementation. As I said, looking at all of the different uh, UN agencies that we're going to be able to call upon, it really will help put um, not only pressure, but supports in place. Some of you will know is that uh, Canada is one of the leading um, countries through the work that we're doing with Rare Diseases International in leading the call for global access to medicines. We're also going to be launching this coming year a global program on newborn screening. So many of the things that we're looking at here are things that are going to be seen as global initiatives and really we want Canada to be able to take that lead. And as many of you know, I actually chair Rare Diseases International, and we're going to make sure that the progress that's being made globally is reflected and is being led by Canada as well. Next slide. So this is, you've seen before, the 12 steps to a national rare disease framework. This is what we've been building our webinars and our conference on. Next. We can move through this, but not to forget that the most important thing we're talking about is to make sure that we're integrating as bills at all the stakeholders and that patients and patient organizations are at the heart of it. Also, our investment in ongoing investment in research and development. This, again, is something that's critical. Canada has such amazing capacity in its clinics and its research um, communities. We need to be able to drive those to the rare disease. Diseases, but also, obviously, we need to make sure that we invest in and that we're able to have the proper kinds of resource support. Next. This we've talked about before, and we're going to talk about all of these opportunities as we're going through today. And as I say, we're going to be doing specific. I think we lost you, Durhan. Yeah. yeah. So there's just one. 
one more slide on the uh, the twelve step steps to RD framework, um, and that's uh, leverage manage manage access programs, uh, concurrent reviews, real world evidence generation, and enhanced centers of clinical expertise. And that last one is a is, is a great segue into our first session, and I can walk through the agenda again while we're waiting for 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 Durhan to come back on. Um, but it's just interesting that we chose, or the CORD chose the 12 step process. That sounds like uh, um, a, a recovery. To... Go ahead. No, I'm going to let you turn and take it over because I don't want to keep. Okay. We've gone through it. I'm going to let you walk through the agenda and um, and really guide the discussion, okay? Okay. Thank, thanks, Durhan. And I'll explain uh, um, how uh, uh, you know the rest of the sessions are going to work with the hopes that uh, you can get back on Durhan to participate in, in some of the conversation uh, a little bit later. Um, so just in terms of what we're going Hello? to do. Oh, uh, sorry, Cheryl, if you don't mind uh, muting there, great. So uh, the, the vision for Canada's rare disease drug program is an integrative, inclusive, innovative, rare drug system with a seamless pathway to patient um, uh, for, for patients. And that's not just about um, access to medicines. It's also making sure that they can get a diagnosis uh, so that they can actually get on or get access to the right treatment. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the governance board and how it's actually um, led in the leadership around it as well. In order to, to build for success, um, uh, CORD has developed this uh, th these two days of, um, uh, of discussions. Uh, the, the format is going to be similar to other uh, conferences that you've been taking part in, but we're gonna to try to get a lot done uh, over uh, the, the next six hours uh, in, in today and tomorrow. Um, uh, Durhan's already talked about what we need to succeed, uh, really building on some of the efforts that are happening at the global level and walking through specific actions that the court is expecting from uh, from governments in, in Canada to actually make this a reality uh, next year. So what we're gonna do uh, um, shortly is we're gonna talk about the first theme, which is expediting timely and optimal access to diagnosis and care. Um, and that was why that last step uh, in, in the 12 steps was talking about uh, centers of, of clinical expertise. And, and we're, we're pleased to be joined by uh, Dr. Hugh McMillan uh, and Dr. Cheryl uh, Rockman Greenberg, who are going to uh, share some new information in terms of what, what they're doing to, to make that a reality. Um, we're gonna have a shorter session after that uh, at 12.15 Eastern uh, to look into a case study on gene therapy for inherited retinal disease. And I think you'll see when we talk about this, uh, where some of the, the barriers and challenges um, uh, that, that really become apparent in Canada that uh, a national strategy would uh, potentially clear uh, if, the, if the strategy was in place. Yeah, I'm on the conference call. This thing starts one. Yeah, which is great. Um, the next session, uh, in terms of platform two, after the case study, we're going to look into a, how to create a competitive access environment for innovation. Uh, and this means drug development, clinical trials, early access, patient support, uh, and involves some of those uh, regulatory issues that, that we brought up before, including uh, the, the, the federal price uh, controls, um, Health Canada collaboration with global regulators, uh, as well as pathways for special access. And so we've got actually a, quite a large panel there um, that will be kicked off in, uh, by, uh, by Eileen McMahon of Tories, but it'll be open for, for everyone to weigh in on some sp specific questions that we've, we've, uh, we've, we've brought forward for this conference. So as you can see, we've got a, a, some excellent, um, uh, very knowledgeable uh, speakers, panelists, and contributors that we've named. But just another note, uh, anyone on the line in the chat or otherwise can put, put their hand up. This is like a town hall. This is, pretend this is a live conference um, and you're helping us co-create and build towards this national strategy. Platform three, we're gonna be talking about um, uh, creating innovative financing pathways. So how can this actually be paid for specific to the needs of patient populations and the characteristics of the therapies that are coming forward? 
um, and it's especially how to leverage managed access programs, uh, concurrent reviews, et cetera. So that will be kicked off by um, the C.D. Howe Institute's uh, Rosalie Wyanch tom uh, uh, tomorrow morning, or depending on where you are in the world, uh, afternoon. Um, platform four, the final platform, we'll be talking about implementing meaningful representative patient engagement throughout the system in air, every area. Um, and I know the panelists are, are cut off here a little bit, but we've got um, a really excellent uh, group that will explain, uh, you know, some ideas for, for how things are working uh, in the blood uh, products review system, for instance, or not working in other, in other uh, parts of the rare disease uh, drug system. Ideally, um, Health Canada is, is on the line and listening to this, taking notes. They're in the middle of the second phase of their consultation on their vision for Canada's national uh, rare disease drug strategy. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, other um, folks that are either involved in or around government will put their hand up and also contribute and take part in this. So please don't be shy, any of the officials who are responsible for, for penning some of these strategies uh, to, to, to get involved. Um, just looking back to 2014-15, uh, CIHR and other officials were very um, involved in helping pull the strategy together. Uh, everyone needs to be on board now with, uh, with, with this kind of consultation uh, that we're having today and tomorrow. So with that, uh, Cord would like to thank uh, the contribution of corporate partners, and you can see them here, um, who, are, who are doing everything they can to improve uh, the lives of patients and families with various disorders. And we are gonna get right into it. That's the end of my slideshow uh, or Durhan slideshow. We're taking it back to the, the broader um, group. I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Hugh McMillan with McGill University uh, Health Center. Um, Hugh, are you, are you there and able to, to join us? Um, yeah, I'm here, Bill, can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, and I can see you loud and clear. Uh, just a note to everyone else, try to mute if you can. Um, bring us your, your knowledge and expertise and your, your thoughts from Montreal, but for the rest of the country. Over to you, Dr. McMillan. No, I'm happy to do that. I I'm, I'm, was trying to share my screen, Bill. It's saying that it's disabled. Is it possible for me to share my screen so I can show some slides? I am going to make sure that that happens. You should be able and to I'm, share now, Dr. McMillan. That's oh. fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, so Andrew. It's really nice to meet everyone. I'm a pediatric neurologist and neuromuscular specialist in Montreal. Um, I'll just confirm with Bill, you can see the slides okay. Terrific. Um, I'll take the next uh, seven or eight minutes just to, um, to show how, how critically important um, these emerging therapies are for uh, many of the children that I follow with neuromuscular or neurological diseases. A good place to start when we're talking about these emerging gene therapies is for us to uh, differentiate gene replacement therapies, which are sometimes coined DNA therapies, from gene modifying therapies, which are sometimes coined RNA therapies. The first gene replacement will replace an abnormal gene. The second will alter the splicing, uh, typically a pre-mRNA. Um, SMA is a great example of that because there's a number of um, wonderful therapies that have become available over the last few years for children in Canada. Um, in, a, in a situation of an individual who has SMA, they're missing the normal survival motor neuron one gene. They have mutations in both alleles and are not able to produce um, RNA and protein through that regular pathway. Now, there is a gene that lies next to it, an SMN2 gene that had been a very early target of research um, because the number of SMN2 copies we have has a, a disease modifying effect. So milder phenotypes are seen with larger numbers of SMN2 copies because each copy produces about 10% of a normal SMN1 gene. So there have been therapies looking at altering splicing of RNA, specifically SPINRASA and EverSD, that will um, alter the splicing and allow an individual who's treated to have a, a larger amount of survival motor neuron protein that's produced. There's an entirely different strategy 
that looks at replacing the missing gene with a cDNA. And that's this approach that's taken with Zolgensma. Um, so that when that gene is replaced under a continuous promoter, there's SMN protein that's produced through that pathway. And we've seen dramatic changes in the natural history of this disease, the most common type being SMA type 1, the severe infantile form, where symptoms are present before six months of age. And we know from very good natural history studies done in the United States that the mean survival of SMA type 1 with two copies of SMN2 is between eight and a half to 10 months old. With these therapies that have become available, particularly when these children are treated pre-symptomatically, we're seeing these children achieve milestones that we never would have imagined previously as a result of this. Now, the gene therapy pipeline is exploding in an exponential manner in terms of um, preclinical work that's being done, as well as um, phase one, two, and even phase three clinical trials. So this is a slide that's, that's um, from the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy, showing annually the number of um, therapies that are coming down the pipeline. And we can see when we look at 2020 and 2021, an exponential rise in uh, preclinical work that's being done, as well as in the lighter shades of purple, phase one and phase two clinical trials. That same um, advancement is also being seen with RNA therapies. And um, there's even a, a larger percentage of phase three trials with the RNA therapies. But you may notice um, when we look at approval of these, there's a number of uh, products that have been approved worldwide and a smaller percentage of them have been approved in Canada. So if we look back at where we've come from and where we're headed in, in just a couple slides, um, it was 89 where the first retrovirus vectors were used for human cancer patients. There was a bit of a chilling effect in 99 when there was an individual that, that died as a consequence of complications from an adenovirus vector, but things have shifted over, particularly in neurology, to AAV vectors, which have much less immunogenicity and are much safer to use. With that comes a very interesting um, story, a made in Canada one, where uh, a treatment, um, Glybera, be became ultimately available and was approved by the EMA for use after extensive work that was done both in British Columbia, as well as participation by patients in Quebec as part of a clinical trial. Now, Glybera, I'm sure you're, you're all familiar with it, was a, it was a very interesting and somewhat tragic story in the sense that despite the Canadian investment, the company that owned Glybera never filed for Health Canada approval. They filed and were given approval in, in the European Union. It was commercially available for two years, but it was removed after two years because only one patient was treated commercially. We have seen, fortunately, over the last few years, um, applications that have been submitted to Health Canada and have received Health Canada approval. And in the most recent case, Zolgensma, having been approved relatively quickly after approval was obtained in the United States, which is, which is a, a great success from my standpoint. There's many other um, gene therapies that are under active clinical trial right now, and these are gene replacement therapies for a number of different pediatric neuromuscular and neurological diseases. Newborn screening as a clinician is key, particularly for these severe, irreversible, early onset diseases. And, and I'm very happy that Ontario has had, had such wonderful success with um, SMA having been added to the newborn screening program over the past almost two years. It was initially funded by Biogen for the first six months on a pilot basis, and the um, Ministry of Health uh, provided funding from that point onwards. And we're seeing that reflected in a number of different countries and jurisdictions around the world where newborn screening is happening more and more. But even before we get to those successes where there's approval that's obtained, where we can start to talk about adding things to newborn screening to detect early and prevent irreversible loss, there's a critical need as a clinician and a cl 
clinical researcher for Canadians to have the opportunity to participate in clinical trials and to have access to emerging therapies. I was very happy for um, many different sites in Canada that we were able to be part of the trials that were so successful for the three products with spinal muscular atrophy. Canadian sites were included in all of those. And, and I would argue, um, this is a, an opinion paper that Dr. Campbell and I um, published a few years back. There's a need for there to be Canadian centers of clinical trial excellence, uh, centers that are established that we can move forward quickly when these trials become available. I would argue that there's a need for um, a reevaluation of regulatory approval, pricing negotiation, streamlining of the work that's being done at Health Canada, CADETH, and then provincial bodies making decisions about um, how much to pay. And there's also a need to reevaluate um, post-approval patient registries, which are critical in this rare disease world so that we can continue to monitor the efficacy of these treatments and be very alert to any potential side effects that might emerge. So I'll stop there after that introduction, Bill. Thank you. Bill, can I jump in? Can you can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear, Durhan. Uh, over to Excellent. you, and then we'll open up the panel. Yeah, I was going to. Uh, I would just like to follow up with what. First of all, thank you so much, Dr. McMillan. And for those of you who don't know, Dr. McMillan, he is probably the you know not just our national but our international leader in terms of uh, not just SMA but. Um, really in terms of pediatric uh, conditions related. So really so grateful for you to be able to take the time to come here. I know that um, you've got a huge schedule that you're juggling here and many people after you, so we can't tell you how much we appreciate it. And it's really contribute to the advancing of access to SMA therapies, you know, starting from the very, very beginning. And also for, as he talked about newborn screening, and um, I think you had the first child that was actually identified through the Ontario Newborn Screening Program, who actually was treated almost immediately after um, she was diagnosed. And um, I think uh, our good news story today, of course, is that this child is doing exceptionally well. And probably if you know, any of us saw her, would probably not be able to distinguish her from a child who does not have SMA. So kudos to everybody in terms of making this available. And certainly kudos to... I really want to shout out to Biogen as well for making their therapies available as that bridging step in many, many cases. I wonder if I can just call on a parent, though, um, somebody who came to our attention and who um, is a parent with a child with SMA um, in Saskatchewan, Lindsay Williamson. And I'm just, Lindsay, if you don't mind, just kind of turning on your camera. If you want to, you don't have to. <laughs> I don't know if you were prepared to, to come on camera and just maybe provide your perspective on the importance of having newborn screening, early access to newborn screening, what it's meant to you, what the challenges have been and what your call out is. Absolutely. Uh, before I get into that, I just want to say a big thank you and hello to Dr. McMillan. Um, this is the first time seeing him, but to be honest, he is the first name uh, that we learned when it came to the SMA community, and he brought so much peace to our family. Um, we moved from Ottawa, where we lived about 10 minutes from his hospital, to Saskatchewan uh, when Mason was born, and when we got the diagnosis, I didn't know what to do, so I sent him an email, and he was so reassuring, and it really opened my eyes to one thing we do well in Canada, and that is the neurologists and the specialists treating SMA are very well connected. And um, for a parent, that's it's amazing to know you get that response quickly that things are working. Um, but what I did want to say, so again, we moving from Ontario to Saskatchewan, there is no newborn screening here, and we were so... Lucky, it took one month actually for Mason. He was born symptomatically. He has SMA type one with two copies of SMN2. And had he not had those symptoms, we likely without newborn screening, it probably would have been much, much longer, five, six, seven months before he got diagnosed. Um, there's another family that I am currently in contact with and their son was symptomatic around two months. And it was really challenging for her because for four months she went to her doctor's and everybody just kind of said, you know, like she felt brushed off. Um, and again, this was not in Ontario. This is not in Saskatchewan either. And it's not a need to point fingers or anything like that. But it's there's so much to know in the healthcare system. And as well as a parent, it's 
you try fiercely to advocate for your child, but when you don't know because you're not a medical professional, but you have that inkling that something is off with them and you just keep trying to do your best um, to get the care that they need. Luckily, this child was diagnosed at six months and um, it took them three days to get the approval for Zolgensma. So they were recently infused this past week, but um, it just reiterates the importance of newborn screening, not only from a healthcare perspective, but also for parents. Um, one thing within the medical field that takes, you know, a lot of burden off of doctors who, again, you are so overworked. There's so much to know. The disease landscape is changing every day to have a newborn screening. That's kind of one less thing to worry about. Did we miss this? Um, and then also for parents, it's we honestly almost found it more difficult to dealing with uh, from time to diagnosis to time to treatment, as opposed to figuring out you know, the diagnosis part, it was just so, um, it was almost more stress around the access to treatment because we were able to get our diagnosis within a month with the screening, of course, that would have come quicker, but, um, so, sorry. so switching into the access to treatment, one thing that could be really beneficial is, um, with the Zolgensma in particular, it is still quite new. It's taking some time uh, within our, how we were able to get approved, we were the first family that had ever applied through our method to our company. And um, it, it took a lot longer than it is taking now, which is great that our efforts have now been expedited for the next family. But it's really unfortunate that there always has to be somebody who is first. And these children are ultimately being political pawns in the interim. So if there could be some sort of network to set up, like in our instance, it was trying to determine, would it be us who would pay for it? Would it be the government that would pay for it? Would it be private insurance? We didn't know, but we knew, you know, if our son qualified for this treatment, we wanted to get him access to it. So how do we go about doing that? And there's nothing in the interim to kind of help expedite that process. Like if I was to call my bank and ask for a $3 million loan, they would laugh at me, but I was willing to do it because this is my child. And, you know, you do whatever you can for them. Um, so I think in terms of timely access to treatment, that hopefully could be something we can work on to do better to um, help ensure that people can get access while we figure out the other things in the background. Uh, Dear Han, I just want to thank you for allowing me to jump in today. I apologize. I'm not a healthcare background in any way, shape or form, but uh, my our little boy in the background, you might hear him babbling a little bit, but we're so grateful for these organizations and all the work so many of you are doing because in our short five months with him, we've learned so much, but we're just so appreciative of the efforts that are coming and how much easier things are going to get for families that come, but it's just, it's a process to get there. So thank you for allowing me to speak today and for all being here. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And I'm going to probably flip it back over to Bill to actually continue with it. But it is so important, not only for people like Lindsay to share their stories and to really call out what is working in the system and what is not yet working in the system. And also the public acknowledge people like Dr. McMillan, who many of us on the inside know how much he does, but the rest of the world may not know as well. But also, I really want to shout out to Lindsay because a um, recent article in the Global Mail where Mason was already being diagnosed and was going to get access to treatment. What SMA parents and parents all across our rare disease um, uh, populations do is that is they hang in there for others. It ain't just about themselves that they're doing this. And we so much appreciate it when they continue to advocate on behalf of the parents and others. So thank you so very much for that. Okay, so we're going to flip back into our regular, pro well, regular scheduled program. <laughs> um, you know, and maybe we'll just flip over to, I know Cheryl, Dr. Greenberg is at the airport, but is actually hanging in there with us. Um, and maybe I'll just open it up, Bill, and let you take it from there. But uh, Dr. Greenberg, you've been on this web series many, many times. You've always brought amazing insights to it. But like Dr. McMillan, uh, Dr. Cheryl Greenberg is one of our treasures in Canada and certainly an outstanding patient advocate. Maybe if I can ask you to respond, what do you, when listening to Dr. McMillan and certainly listening to Lindsay, what is your reflection? How similar is their experience in terms of SMA to what you've experienced in terms of the rare diseases that you've been supporting and your calls for um, what should take place under this new drug strategy? Thanks. Thanks very much. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. All righty. Um, well, I certainly enjoyed. Um, the introduction that you gave, Doreen, and what Dr. McMillan has said, and 
And I don't have any slides, but I think it's, uh, you know, it would very much, you know, reiterate some of the, all the things that you and Dr. McMillan have already said. And I, I understand this whole exercise is really to help speed up the access to treatments. And that includes, you know, from your 12 step enhancing and enhancing access to preclinical research, enhancing access to clinical trials that, you know, I've been involved with and Dr. McMillan and everyone is in. And uh, then it's so important is the post marketing evaluation. And that's where, you know, issues that you bring up in terms of how do you incorporate real world evidence into decision makings in terms of access to treatments. So there's, um, but the ultimate goal is to enhance access to treatments, but the treatments have to be proven and they have to be, you know, based on what we scientifically proven evidence. And, and that's, I mean, when I listen to Dr. McMillan and I know the SMA journey about what, what needed to be done to get approvals for this increasing list of drugs and it's continuing increasing that will be effective in SMA. Um, it's, it's really a hard slug to, to first to develop the protocols that are going to be able to scientifically answer the right questions and get the proof that we need to get all these new treatments you know, um, into, into the hands of the patients who need them. Um, you know, but also from the patient perspective, I still worry about you know, the access to diagnosis. And um, though, of course, I'm a great proponent of newborn screening completely, it's going to take a while till other provinces come on board for newborn screening for SMA, including my province. I mean, there, as you know, in Canada, we have not one healthcare system, but we have you know, 10 provincial and three territorial health systems. And the newborn screen world is very heterogeneous and it takes a long time to be able to convince your provincial health authorities to add new diseases to the platform of diseases that are screened for at birth. A lot of that has to be based on evidence and it has to be based on you know, needs for individual provinces and territories. And it also has to be based on, are there proven effective treatments that of course are going to be very, very costly, but are they effective? And SMA, I mean, to me, moved remarkably quickly. And I know it's never fast enough for the patient. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that the newborn screening part will take some time. And um, universally across Canada, of course, we want every patient to have access to the earliest diagnosis to ensure optimum outcome. You know, but one of the things about the, you know, expanding the, um, platform of diseases screened for at birth is that there are already many diseases in the queue that still haven't been funded in my province of Manitoba. Uh, you know, we're still working on um, hemoglobinopathies, if you can believe it, that are still not screened for at birth. And, you know, you know how do you prioritize if there are not unlimited funds, and they're not unlimited funds, which diseases should be added to the platform of diseases diagnosed rate at birth. And that's not even talking about how do you incorporate the new technologies using genomics and next-gen sequencing in newborn screening, because that will change the, 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 the question and the whole um, picture completely. So I think individual provinces have a great deal of difficulty in as new diagnoses are made new treatments are available as evidence is concluding, you know, is this appropriate to introduce to newborn screening? And I mean, from a clinical point of view, I mean, it's very nice to diagnose SMA rate at birth, but we have to train our clinicians um, to be able to recognize the very early signs of infantile SMA. Um, I mean, the, the, the art of medicine and diagnosis still remains the art of medicine and, and diagnosis. Um, I wanted to just raise the point uh, with respect to cystic fibrosis. 
And you know that more and more provinces now have approved access to Trikafka. And, you know, that has, uh, will revolutionize, we hope, the outcomes of patients with cystic fibrosis who have at least one Delta F508 mutation, which is most of the patients. Um, but, in, you know, and more recently, it's been approved with the several provinces. But to get access to the drug, you have to have more recent proof that you have at least one Delta F508 mutation. And I've had calls from people who cannot, you know, who are candidates and are approved for Trikafka, but they have to go back and get their DNA testing again for their provincial authorities to prove uh, that in a diagnostic approved lab that they have one Delta F508 mutation. And, you know, these are hurdles that we all have to face. They're, they're very inconvenient. But these little details are something that we have to pay attention to, you know, when we develop a rare disease strategy. You can, you, you can do the clinical trial, you can have an effective drug, but how do you guarantee access to the drug? I mean, I'll go back to evidence again, but, um, you know, there are so many little hurdles to actually get patients on, the, on, on a treatment. There's one other example I want to give. Uh, many people know that, you know, I've been involved in, you know, the access to the new treatment for hypophosphatasia, the metabolic bone disease caused by a, a lack of alkaline phosphatase. And, you know, in uh, 2016, Cadiz, um recommended to the PCPA to negotiate um, a, a, a drug reimbursement plan for um, Asphatase Alpha and for the provinces to list it on their formularies. Well, it's been five years and some provinces either have just listed it or have not yet listed it. And this is very, very you know, frustrating for patients. So again, you have a gap between you know, the preclinical, the clinical trial work, the evidence, and ultimately to get it on provincial formularies and to be reimbursed. Um, the, the situation with asphatase alpha brings up what I know is near and dear to Duraine's heart, heart about how to integrate real world evidence into our healthcare decision making. And that's something we're trying to do for hypophosphatasia, collect the real world evidence. Um, but I've had several calls from patients in various provinces who have diagnosed hypophosphatasia, um, but cannot even access um, a physician who's willing to go that extra mile to apply for special access, up, um, either through Health Canada, uh, through compassionate care programs sponsored by the, um, by the industry, um, or through private insurance. So patients get you know, very discouraged because they may even get a diagnosis. They know there's a approved treatment, but it may not be approved yet for their age group. And all the other options that they have in trying to access the medication um, shows how wide the gap can be for some of these ultra rare diseases. So any strategy that we're trying to move forward at a national level, to me, the end result is that we do need, and one of the things that Dr. McMillan mentioned, a national committee to be able to, um, to speak for all rare diseases, but at, at various stages, and that both companies, individuals, um, provincial health authorities can refer to. So I really, really do feel that the, at the national level, um, we do need a national rare disease uh, committee strategy uh, that can deal with these, uh, these questions and offer concrete and practical solutions for the patients. So I think I'll stop here, Duray, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Greenberg and, and Dr. McMillan. I, I think, um, Dr. McMillan, McMillan, it'd be great if you could respond, but we, I wanna introduce the, the, the three other people who uh, have been invited to this panel and this discussion. Uh, um, two of them are 
uh, from the developers of, of these medicines. And what the call out that I think that you've said, you've brought Dr. Greenberg is look ahead, figure out the access pathway challenges might be down there, uh, adult uh, screening, not just newborn screening. Um, and so that's why I think it's, it'll be great to hear from uh, a former colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Frédéric Lavois, Vice President of Access and Government Relations at Pfizer. It's great to see you, Fred, uh, today virtually, hopefully soon in person. And we've got uh, Brent Warner, uh, Vice President of Gene Therapy and Rare Disease at Novartis. Um, thank you very much. And uh, of course, in terms of the, the, the theme, this theme is uh, really the national networks what's needed across the country uh, and that's why we're, we're, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Thierry Lacaz Mamonte, a scientific director of the Maternal Infant Child and Youth Research Network, um, also known as MICERN. So um, I don't know, Dr. McMillan, if you want to take a couple seconds to respond and then we'll throw it over, I think, to, you know, the, the developers to, to let us know how they see that roadmap. I loved your images, by the way, of, of, the, of the roads because that's, uh, I think that, that we're gonna come back to that in a second. So Dr. McMillan, over to you and then, uh, and then Fred and Brent. Terrific. I'll just take 30 seconds. I, I agree with everything Dr. Greenberg said. Um, I wanted to mention that with SMA, I, I, in my opinion, one of the reasons why things did move relatively quickly in the scientific world and in clinical trials was because we had the benefit of excellent natural history data. So, so when someone's designing a clinical trial, it's essential that we know what to measure, because if we measure the wrong thing, a drug may look like it's ineffective, not because it doesn't work, but because we didn't study the right thing. So it was essential, the work that was done largely in the United States, looking at SMA, um, unique features about it, how it progresses, what might we expect could improve, um, the CHOP and 10 score, which was designed specifically for that. And I would argue that there is a need for us to collect data, ideally for all rare diseases, but to at least be collecting da data in some sort of standardized way um, that's organized across different Canadian centers. So when the time comes that there's a therapy that looks like it may be helpful, we can move quickly and we can say, this is what we need to study to determine if this specific rare or ultra rare disease may benefit from, from this treatment that we're, we're implementing. It's not enough just to give it. We have to know what to look at to see if there's a measurable response. So let's throw that over to to Fred and, and Brent. Uh, are, 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 have you taken notes? Are these things that you're already uh, working on right now? I think there's been lots of call-outs from Drs. Greenberg and McMillan already. Yeah, I, I can jump in if you want, Bill. And uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation uh, to Duran. And uh, and it's a pleasure. It's an honor to be on, on the panel. And thanks to Dr. McMillan and Greenberg. Like your comments were, were extraordinary. Um, I mean, I, I, I was reflecting on, on this to start with, and uh, I think what, what comes to mind when I hear all of the sort of journey from a patient standpoint, from a clinician, from a researcher, an academic perspective, is that uh, is the, the, what, the, the word that comes to mind is, is integration, and there's gap of integration horizontally and vertically uh, across the, the, the journey of, of a patient with a rare condition. Um, and I think this is something that we need to address. Like we're, we are data rich, but we are information poor where we have data. Like I, I recognize that in some jurisdictions, again, Canada is a very fragmented environment. So in some jurisdictions, we may not be as well suited as, as in others, but where we, we are rich in data, we're not necessarily rich in information. Um, and I, I think we, that's what we've seen through our partnerships um, uh, in various areas where uh, you know, sometimes there's there's a symmetry that we need to fix from, uh, you know, from between the labs that do the diagnostics and uh, and the, the care centers uh, who care for patients. So so that's what I mean by horizontal uh, integration. And I think on the vertical integration, I think it's an issue as well. And it 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 was highlighted. Uh, we've got challenges uh, because you know all of this data, if it was well integrated, like we could bring much more evidence uh, towards the uncertainty that's constantly highlighted in this space of rare disease, um, which is all across the entire journey, all the way to treatment with drugs. And we're in the space of, you know, making sure that drug is ex are, drugs are accessible, 
uh, easily accessible, timely accessible, that these are the principles that many of us are sharing together. Uh, and, and one of the issues is, is that uncertainty needs to be fixed and we need to learn on the go, we then to conditionally approve these products and continuously learn from the evidence that could be gathered. So if we had a good vertical integration of, of all of the data requirements uh, or data initiatives, data collection initiatives, I think we would do uh, far better. And, uh, and yesterday I just came across a, a Globe and Mail article that was quite interesting. And I hate to bring it up because it's again, a, a, le a lessons learned from the COVID experience, but I think it, it was so timely with this conversation. So that there's a, um, there's a Penn Canadian Health Data Strategy Expert Advisory Group that was looking into, into uh, the situation around COVID. And, and their report says the systems across the country that aren't standardized and can talk to each other have limited Canada's ability to respond to COVID-19, including managing vaccines and tracking variants. More broadly, that reality is also hurting patient care and could hamper the response to other health crises, uh, the report says. So, so to me, you could replace COVID by rare diseases, by any rare diseases, uh, and, and this would apply to our situation. And I think we have to treat, uh, you know, rare diseases with the same sense of urgency. And what this, what this report highlights is the fact that, you know, a lot of the data holders and the clinic, that in the clinical world, um, they're, con they're constrained by privacy legislation. And we have to move from this culture of being, of being under the constraint by privacy legislation uh, towards a culture where, you know, people are champion of data sharing, champions of data access, champions of data use, also champions of data protection, but, you know, predominantly champions of data sharing. And if we were to be able to do this, I think we would solve for a lot of integration issues uh, of data from an horizontal perspective as well as from a vertical perspective. So that's that's terrific and, and we're, we're getting uh direct actions or or next steps coming out already uh so dr greenberg an expert committee um and actually somebody in the chat group just asked for a copy of the um uh the globe and mail article so i'll put a link to that for everybody uh so that everyone can see that and so thank you fred i, I read that article too i think you know that's something for it's great that that well, i think what you're saying is that COVID has shone a light on the disjointed nature of Canada that, that actually can help uh, improve the lives of everybody, not just solve for COVID, solve for rare too. Brent, um, over yes. to you. What's happening at Novartis? A lot of your, your Zogensma featured heavily earlier in our discussion. So where are you going uh, with, with this, this discussion? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and so can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, great. The technology in this room works today. So uh, nice to see you all. So I think Frederick had on a, a key point when he was opening up his commentary, which is the patient journey. And if I go back to Lindsay, who shared her story in the beginning, right, of you know, having to figure out the system, having to figure out where to go, having to figure out, you know, how am I going to get access to the medicine? No, no parent, no family should ever have to deal with that, particularly in a country like Canada, which has you know, some of the, the best clinicians in the world, and we should have some of the best healthcare in the world. When I think about that, and I, even I think about newborn screening, for instance, uh, I mean, we're very fortunate Biogen made the initial push with Ontario to bring newborn screening online. Yeah, but it's, too, it's, it's late still for all of us, right? Particularly now that we have three therapies to treat SMA. I think Spinraza was approved three and a half years ago. It's very late. We need to be faster in patients. And I think we can be faster as a system overall when it comes to genetic testing, newborn screening. You know, I think right now what we continue to see worldwide is when a therapy is approved, you know, it takes some time to scale up newborn screening. I think we can be smarter about when we start investing in public-private partnerships to do newborn screening, to do genetic testing. You know, we need to start looking at different ways as well. The newborn screening system today, while you know, it has been around for a decade, you know, but it only captures right now a handful of diseases. There are other ways that we can start looking at this in the future through whole genome sequencing, exome sequencing that will really allow us to capture more genetic diseases, understand more of the patient population, 
And if you go to where Frederic was saying the data integration piece, by being able to capture more understanding of what's happening in a certain patient population across a whole swath of rare diseases, we will be able to feed that into you know, the machine of artificial intelligence and data generation and really start being able to make some smarter decisions, right? Not only when it comes to therapeutic development, but how we manage and treat patients. So when I, when I think about the newborn screening piece that we were talking about in the beginning, we can go faster, but more importantly, I think what newborn screening has allowed us to do in the last two years is really say, can we do this better? Can we do this faster as a community collectively? And how do we better serve patients with rare diseases utilizing that platform? That's an excellent segue, uh, Brent, into my CERN, I think, because you're not just looking at one uh, disease area, if I'm not mistaken, Thierry. It's, tell us a little bit more about the glue that you're creating for, for across different therapeutic areas and, and how MyCERN is going to solve for some of these issues. Yeah, sure. So first, thank you for inviting me. I, I'm thrilled to be, uh, to be here. And I feel also uh, very much honored to, uh, to um, you know, hear stories. And uh, there is nothing more encouraging for us at MyCERN and uh, our centers, you know, to hear those stories, to continue working hard for uh, uh, for this cause to facilitate, you know, access uh, 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 for our patients to uh, rare, you know, uh, and very, very innovative drugs. So my son is a, a network of uh, that federate all uh, pediatric uh, uh, academic organizations plus a few uh, maternal academic centers. We have uh, around 30 uh, subspecialty affiliated network. Many are in the rare disease space, but not all of them. And three years ago, uh, through a strategic uh, planning exercise uh, uh, with our board and uh, our members, we decided to uh, prioritize clinical trials with the goal to facilitate uh, uh, the conductions of clinical trials across the country. Uh, we have an emphasis of on uh, investigator initiated trial, but we really want to work with industry uh, to bring more trial to Canada. So what we have done over the last three years, we have a consortium of experts uh, present at each site, and we have been working on uh, site standards for clinical research unit, uh, uh, collections of indicators on clinical trials. We have also developed uh, services that I would call uh, a sponsorship kind of task or services that uh, academic research organizations offer. And we are expanding uh, uh, as we speak. And we have now uh, capacity to actually help investigators in many aspects around the regulations. Actually, as I speak today, we are in process to submit a single patient study applications to Health Canada for a very rare conditions. So we are building expertise. Uh, we are working uh, uh, with um, experts and uh, uh, to facilitate and to streamline the uh, regulatory process, which is, you know, one of the uh, roadblocks in Canada. Uh, for instance, uh, we are part of the uh, CHEER initiative, which the ultimate goal is to have one uh, uh, ethics review for, uh, 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 for all sites, uh, all pediatric uh, studies in Canada. This is a complex process. There is uh, legislations that we need you know, to uh, circumvent, but we are quite optimistic. And as we speak, we have now seven uh, uh, RB across the country that uh, have been qualified as board of record for this uh, initiative. So what we see here with this opportunity is, is, is absolutely amazing in terms of uh, building on uh, 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 what we have done so far and actually developing this network of uh, clinical trial uh, uh, excellence uh, by working with our consortium. And really to do that, we, we need certainly fundings. And so uh, that might be the opportunity today with this initiative, but we have already a lot of things in place. We have partnership with our network, with national organizations like Children's Healthcare Canada, like CPS, like CHR. Uh, and, uh, and we have the buy-in of our uh, members. Last week, we had our uh, annual uh, assembly with our board and our members, and uh, we discussed at length this concept of clinical trial infrastructure and whether we should you know, uh, roll off sleeves, write a grant, 
and maybe take advantage of this initiative by working with with you and the uh, you know the rare disease network so we are very excited and we don't we don't do everything but on the clinical trial piece working with uh, industry working with uh, our academic partner i think we can make a difference i just want to finish that we also have established partnership uh, uh, with uh, uh, organizations in the US and in Europe. We work closely with C4C and C4C is a consortium industry academia in Europe. Uh, the goal is to develop this uh, clinical trial infrastructure. We have also uh, uh, relationships with IAC in the US and we are a member of NPREMA. So there is also opportunity here to use this platform to, uh, 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 to work with a global approach, because I think that the future is really working with our partners all across the globe to facilitate access, uh, uh, not only in Canada, but in, in all other countries. Amazing. Thank you so much, Thierry. Um, the original image that, that Durhan had on uh, the, the opening slide showed a toolbox, right, with, with uh, lots of different tools, uh, but I want to come back to the, the corresponding image from Dr. McMillan, maybe go back to you, uh, in terms of the roadmap to um, wellness or, or better health for patients with rare disorders. Um, one thing that jumped out from your presentation was that Canada doesn't seem to be getting access to a lot of these gene therapies in a relatively timely fashion. Uh, there were only five of maybe 16 and they were coming to Europe and, and elsewhere faster. And maybe this is a, you know, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that or we should bring it over to the, the developers. Is that because of some of the obstacles on the road that are further down, including screening, diagnosis, et cetera? So what's preventing Canada from not just getting access to the trials and the research, but, but actually uh, making the decision to, to, to commercialize a medicine here. So I don't know who wants to take that, but I, that's a, an issue that jumped out that I don't think we've, we've talked about yet. Well, actually, I, actually, Dr. Greenberg highlighted uh, uh, some examples of, uh, of uh, you know, a, a product that's been agreed upon from a PCP perspective, and yet uh, there's still several jurisdictions that uh, are not granting access. That's one one of the issue. Again, highlighting the fact that uh, I mean Canada is a very fragmented uh, jurisdiction a set of jurisdictions. Um, and I think the I think the other example that was uh, quite uh, amazing as well is uh, it, highlighted by Dr. Greenberg is is the fact that you know even though sometimes the product is accessible, there is still requirements to redo things that patients have already done. Um, because, because again, the data is not integrated together. So, so if we treated this with the principle that we all share, which is, you know, uh, um, you know, a patient-centered self, like healthcare approach, like we would, we would not ask for these several duplications. We we would treat this consistently um, as much as possible. Uh, and again, this might have to do uh, somewhat with the, the sort of cultural traits of being data custodians as opposed to champions of data sharing uh, in pursuing the, the pure, the true benefit uh, of patient care and their, and their families. So, so I, I think we just need to work harder. Um, and I, I, I see this as an opportunity. Uh, we, can, we can all look at this challenge. And I, again, you know, uh, uh, just hearing from uh, Dr. Lacaz, like it, it was interesting to see uh, how, many, how many partnerships and how many work is happening to try to um, remove the obstacles towards sharing information together. Um, it's, it's great, it's fantastic, but it's very time consuming. And that's why, that's why uh, maybe it is seen as a big obstacle for many stakeholders. Uh, and it probably gets in the way of getting a lot of things done. So imagine if we were um, to reinforce or to promote this culture of data champions, um, we would probably see many of these obstacles go down. We would probably see um, you know, the cost of doing um, this type of work reduced significantly. And I think we would all be in a better space to be able to allocate resources where uh, that are more centered towards patient care rather than centered towards uh, you know, maybe a culture of protecting information. I think it's important to protect information, don't get me wrong, but we could do this while in the same time pursuing a greater collaboration and integration of information um, to the benefit of patients. 
Doctors Greenberg, McMillan, any, any thoughts there? I mean, uh, Cheryl, you mentioned a, a committee of clinical experts. I, I think that both of you would be potentially top of that list as potential calls to bring your toolboxes to remove obstacles. But what, what did you think about what, what Fred is uh, suggesting in terms of how to get out on the road and get ahead of these issues? Yeah, well, I agree, although we're fragmented in terms of 10 provinces and three territories, there is indeed a room, room for um, a national organization, a national committee to be able to triage questions in many different spheres. Um, that's one of the things that the Garrett Association of Canada as an umbrella organization for health professionals involved in the diagnosis of inborn errors of metabolism has wanted to take on that role of being a go-to organization to help triage questions related to um, ultra rare metabolic diseases uh, or doesn't even have to be ultra rare metabolic diseases, but that's um, just a small portion of the umbrella of rare diseases that fall under the umbrella of CORD. They're not all classified as inborn errors of metabolism. But I, I think organizations such as the Garrett Association of Canada can play a role um, to help field general questions and help get people to, uh, you know, hooked up with the right, um, right organizations. Um, but I, I mean, I, I think, although we're large geographically, there, we can have an effective national committee, both looking at, you know, um, accumulating, I think Dr. McMillan mentioned, we need a list of all the clinical trials being done in Canada, and be able to be able to give people information you know, how to access clinical trials, or if people not wanting to be involved in clinical trials, how to access information and other families to bring them together. Um, but I think, you know, at the beginning, Duran talks, and you have mentioned, the patient has to be at the center of everything. And if we remember why we're here to care for the needs of patients, then everything else should fall into place, including a national perspective national organization to be able to um, coordinate and help fill these gaps. Excellent. Um, Hugh, I don't know if you want to jump back in on, on this. Have you, have you seen that, that roadmap improve even over the course of this discussion if we move forward on some of the ideas? And, and thank you for contributing to the chat group as well. I think there's some, so we're going to be copying that uh, for, for the notes and, and uh, read out as well from this conference. But what, yeah. what, what are your thoughts? No, absolutely. A couple thoughts. Um, number one, um, I think one of the um, attractions, um, in my opinion, for sponsors to potentially run clinical trials in Canada is we are very well organized. We do very well at, at running those trials, in my opinion, speaking on behalf of my colleagues across the country. What can be very helpful, though, is if we have registries like the Canadian Neuromuscular Disease Registry, where when a sponsor comes and they say, how many people do you have in Canada with Duchenne muscular dystrophy between the age of four and 10, and then we can say across the country we have 100 people and then they say well that's that sounds like something we want to invest in we want to go through the health canada process to submit a clinical trial application and and include canadian sites so so um that's why i think being ready and having those registries can really put us in a good place so that we can attract sponsors to come here invest here and then we're we're demonstrating we're well organized and we're able to start to move ahead and, and recruit these patients so that's been a real success for many of the neuromuscular trials that, that have included many Canadian sites. And, and we're very altruistic in the sense that, you know, it doesn't have to be a site in any given city. What's really important for us as clinicians in, in the collaborative approach we take is that there are sites in Canada um, that are relatively close by that we can send our patients to, even if it doesn't maybe make as much sense for it to be in our given city. So, so I think that's important is that organization um, upfront is to, to have those lists and those registries and to be organized from a patient um, standpoint. So um, one of the questions we wanted to bring forward was who pays for these registries? And maybe that's, uh, we can bring that back down to, to my CERN and, and to Novartis, uh, uh, Brent, any thoughts on that? And, and Thierry, if you want to um, contribute to that as well, it'd be great. Uh, it, 
either. Uh, don't, we can be very Canadian. You first. You first. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I, I guess it's a, it's a shared responsibility and uh, uh, public-private partnership uh, is probably the way to go. Uh, but uh, you know, part of the uh, proposed fundings could be uh, in integrated into the uh, the uh, the need for developing registry, where you know you can not only collect data and you know, engage patients to actually uh, work around the uh, research priorities, but you can actually build uh, a, a clinical trial on the registry. And there are actually groups doing that right now. The Inform Rare group, which is funded by CH, uh, is developing a registry-based uh, clinical trial. So develop, they, they develop expertise in terms of design and data collections as we speak. Hmm. Yeah, and just to, just to build on that, I mean, from, our, from my side and our side, what you spoke about, right, is the public-private partnerships. To me, that's the, the key of much of what we're talking about today and over the next uh, two days here. I think having a pharmaceutical company uh, collaborate with the right stakeholders at the right time will help move these things forward. Um, if you look at some of the collaborations even in the last year, you know, either through newborn screening, CNDR, there are ways to do this in a, in a means that allow us to move with speed, rigor, but also ensure that you know, patients don't get left waiting you know, to get access to these clinical trials. And to me, I think Cheryl and Hugh and Frederick, you all hit on the key point of putting patient at the center. If the patient truly is at the center, then we can find ways to collaborate in a compliant, thoughtful way that goes above and beyond for patients. And really, the goal is to make sure that patients get faster access to medicines. Just to, to, I think that we've talked about this on court conferences recently, but a, um, and then yeah, Cheryl, I see your hand up. Uh, the Health Canada vision for our national rare disease strategy, right at the top of its, its strategy is uh, improved health for Canadians with rare disorders. So they have that as the vision. That's the goal at the end of the road. And um, I, you know, I can't stress that enough. Uh, the entire strategy under that so far follows that vision. So I, I have a lot of um, hope and optimism that we've got the right people and they're actually listening to us. I'm sure they're listening to us right now um, and this is helping. So Cheryl, maybe the last word to you because I think uh, Durhan wants to yeah. the next case study. Yeah, I, I, I'd like the last word. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I just want to point out or maybe I will send you the link um, when you talk about issues related to patient registries. Because I participate in industry-sponsored registries that are, you know, that are very, very important. And um, I've also participated in investigator-sponsored, you know, publicly funded registries. And uh, Sandra Sirs and colleagues, of which I was participating, recently published an article how independent post-marketing registries are cost-effective tools to provide uh, effective surveillance for orphan drug medical products. And I'll just send that to you. And um, so I think there is a role for registries, but I'd like to make a plea that um, an independent registry as a blanket organization for a lot of these rare disease registries can be cost effective and also can help provide real world evidence for, uh, for other post-marketing decisions. So I'm gonna send that to you, o okay? Um, so thank you. That, that, that'd be terrific. And thanks to everyone who are the, the delegates on the line. We've heard from Fighting Blindness Canada. Uh, my friend Kim Steele from Cystic Fibrosis Canada have noted, you know, individual and corporate donors pay for our registry. So it is run by the, the, the patient organization. Uh, and looking at a fee-for-service model uh, for data requests. So I, I think there's some really neat innovations that are coming out of the not-for-profit health charity <laughs> group that, that we, we got to keep an eye on. Um, and the, the last one, uh, uh, Doug Earl talking about fighting blindness Canada. Um, I think we're probably going to learn more about that. Um, if we can get, if we can hear from Durhan, how's your audio right now, Durhan? Uh, to help close out this panel and, and lead off, kick off the next one. 
No, actually, this is the perfect segue already, right? Because what we've identified is that we need national platforms. We need everybody to be able to take part, whether it's a national platform in terms of access, whether it's a national platform in terms of data sharing, whether it's a national platform in terms of guidelines, in terms of management of the information. So we all agree. Now, governance of that platform has got to be a shared responsibility. But at the end of the day in Canada, we still believe it needs to be independent, but independent probably means under a public umbrella. And I was really delighted to be on a panel with the private payers, you know, at a Tyler symposium and at a um, symposium with Northwinds, where it was really clear, the private sector, the private insurance sector, the private pharma sector are all agreeing, we need to all play ball and we need to play ball together. So who funds it can be very different from who's gonna govern it. And I think that's an important lesson we can learn from the Europeans. The, you know, IMI has really demonstrated that. So, but I don't wanna take up too much time here because this has been a brilliant panel. And I think we will build on this again. There's so many topics that came out of here that we can do standalone seminars on, including patient registries, including the integration, you know, across diseases, and certainly the building what Terry talked about in terms of that clinical trials platform. So what I'm going to do now is to really open it up to our next session, which is really important because it highlights several things that we've been talking about and moves us into certainly some of the deficiencies in our current system, but also leads directly to some of the recommendations. Just in a nutshell, this is going to be a case study on gene therapy for inherited retinal disease. Um, I think some of you will know is that, you know, back in 2020, October, we had the first approval for the first therapy for what was a previously untreated retinal disease. One-time therapy replaces dysfunctional, you know, genes for, um, with working copies that restore vision and eyesight for particular specific diseases. There are many others of these gene therapies in the works. What we do know is there's an urgent need right now for access to Luxturna, and we're really at a critical stage for some of these young people who are really at risk of losing their eyesight because you've got to have some functional cones before you, know, you apply to therapy. So this is critical. goes back to what Hugh said, you know, we have this big gap between the time when it's approved and then even the time when CADIS gives a recommendation to the time it gets reimbursed. And we're finding that there's a gap here as well in terms of our privacy as uh, a researcher. So I'm going to throw it over to some of my favorite people, Dr. Lise Ong, who is like Hugh and Cheryl, international experts, internationally recognized, and whom we don't celebrate enough in Canada, who do great things for us. I also would like to introduce, um, who's at the Hospital for Sick Children, Doug Earl, whom I've known embarrassingly for almost, for more than 30 years, many, many life, life, um, uh, uh, life roles, I guess, Doug and who is now the CEO of Fighting Blindness Canada, and he will introduce two of the patient advocates who are going to speak to it. So I'm going to turn it over to, I, I don't know, directly to Dr. Aon, unless, Doug, you want to uh, introduce something else here first. I think Doug's running. Doug's running the session. All right. I think. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Guide like, me. Sure. Uh, can uh, people hear me? Um, so I, I just want to uh, thank for the opportunity to share this case study because I think it really does inform uh, the uh, agenda for this uh, conference. And it is a case study about how the system is working today and why we really need a rare disease strategy in Canada. Uh, and, and so that, that the experiences that Dr. Aon has uh, had in, in being a trailblazer in this space and, and our two patients uh, that, that have lived experience uh, around the, what, where we are in the system today, Jack and Sika. So, so that, let's just talk a little bit about a, a, a moment. Uh, you know, this, this is an amazing moment in time for the uh, vision loss community. Uh, you know, and, and we, we are very pleased, uh, you know, that we are in this moment when, when innovative treatments that can transform lives are 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 available. They're you know with Luxterna, as Darhan said, was approved over a year ago as a treatment in this country. But the story, I think, uh, the journey that we've been on is says an awful lot about why we need a rare disease strategy. So it, it was literally 12 years ago. Dr. Aon used the Fighting Blindness Canada's patient registry. We identified five patients. They had to go to Philadelphia to participate in a phase one 
uh, RPE65, which is the targeted gene therapy. Uh, you know, five of those Canadians, though they're they're in their one eye, that that uh, has stabilized their sight. In their other eye, it is following the natural progression of the disease. And, and you know, the system did, the Patent Medicines Price Review Board, Health Canada, uh, Cadeth, they all informed uh, the Canadian system in 2015, 2016, that, that Luxterna was coming, this gene therapy was coming. And, and when the US government's FDA approved it in December, 2017, uh, there was many in Canada that did a high five uh, because we, we wanted this treatment here in this country. But it's been four years and there is an economic barrier to access to this treatment right now that has not been resolved. We do not have access. It's been approved, but, it, but we don't have access. And it, and it, is, it is quite troubling. So, so we, you know, we, we participated as, as a patient organization uh, we did a social economic impact study called IRD counts. We we submitted it through the process. You know, we defined the social economic impact of one point six billion dollars for for an inherited retinal disease community of twenty one thousand Canadians. Um, you know, we contributed to the dialogue when given an opportunity, the one and only opportunity we had formally with the CADF process. You know, almost 600 members of our community participated in a survey. We did a case study because the Quebec government did allow for one patient to go, go in compassionate access to the United States to get this treatment, Sam's story. Uh, and, uh, and we submitted our input into the system. Um, and, and, you know, Kudos to Health Canada and CADF. They, they developed a gene therapy special track. Um, it took 10 months for the review of the application. Uh, you know, one month later, CADF and then Ines, so shortly thereafter, recommended it for public funding in 2020. Uh, and then we hit the, the provincial organizations, uh, government organization called Pan Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance. And it, it was almost a year, November 25th. So just a few days ago, uh, the provincial governments decided that yes, they would want to pursue uh, having access to this treatment and, and have issued a letter of engagement to start the negotiation. That year of them thinking about uh, whether or not to access this treatment has been uh, you know, well beyond their performance standard. And now they're telling us the performance standard is up to four months for this negotiation. Well, well, we know that, that uh, Zolgensma had quite a longer time. And so our community is still sitting there and, and Jack and Sika will talk about that in a moment. But where are we internationally? You know, 25 countries have approved Luxterna as a treatment. 19 of them have figured out a reimbursement pathway for this treatment. You know, the UK, Germany, France, Canadians would really think we, you know, that that's the list we should be a part of. Australia, even Croatia has figured out how to reimburse this treatment. And Croatia was a year ago. Um, you know, the six countries that are still trying to figure out what they're going to do, whether or not they're going to publicly fund this treatment or another reimbursement strategy, Brazil, Argentina, Poland, Greece, Portugal, and Canada. I don't think Canadians really think that we would be a part of that list, that we would be part of a list like Germany or France. So it is, it is a bit about, uh, you know, this, uh, this part of this uh, work. Um, and while this is going on, since Health Canada has approved this treatment, uh, over 4 million photoreceptors have died. And there, you know, because of our patient registry, and because of the great network that we built with uh, Dr. Aon's leadership in our patient registry, you know, we, we have 41 Canadians on a waiting list that, that was identified very shortly after Health Canada approved the treatment because of that patient registry and because of the work that have been done over these, over these years. Uh, you know, and and uh, some of those people on this waiting list, by the time it does not get out of uh, our that we you know, go through this bureaucratic process, some may call it dithering, around approving this treatment for public funding, uh, they will not have enough photoreceptors to, uh, to start. 
So I, I invite uh, Dr. Aon uh, and Jock, I know Jock and Sukha would like to share as well their personal journey as a part of this uh, case study. So Dr. Aon. Thank you, Doug. And, and thank you, Duran, for supporting us uh, on this journey. You've been really amazing. Um, I've been following these patients for 25 years and they relentlessly go blind. It's, it's really sad. And the kids now know that there's a treatment available. It's just not accessible. We went through, when I hear the story of Glybera, we went through a similar story where we helped the initial company, Spark, uh, provide natural history data and all that. And there was just no interest to uh, provide submission to Health Canada, despite many, many, so many requests. And so it's been very frustrating because we've, because it's the only good thing maybe of our healthcare system right now is that we're able to follow up our patients. So we, we did have good internal natural history and our patients were identified because we molecularly characterize all our patients. The problem that this causes right now that I hadn't mentioned to Doug is that we're involved in several other clinical trials right now, but the companies are hesitant because they see the difficulty we have with Luxturna. So they say, is it worth our while to include you? Uh, or are we going to hit a wall like Luxturna? And I'm like, oh, no, 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 that's a, it's a special situation. Of course not. Canadian government's very receptive. But it's very frustrating because one injection in, in a child would be a life changer like SMA, and the child could have like a pretty normal life. But every year of delay, decreases the ability uh, to maximize the benefit of such a product. But our colleagues in Europe and in the US say, as long as you see light, you can, you can benefit from the treatment. The, the size of the effect is just less. So we've been working with Jack, try to get um, private insurance funding. And interestingly, because this condition is misnamed labor's congenital amaurosis. It's the name of a guy who put it on it, but it's not a congenital disease. And so his insurance company said, well, you could only be treated until the age of two, but you're not eligible at the age of two. And so we're trying to educate uh, the administrative community about the real nature of this condition. So I'm happy to answer any question. Doug. Uh, so I, uh, Sika, uh, if you could unmute and share your, your journey with your daughter, daughter Nora. Nora. Yeah. Um, I'm Sitka. My daughter, Nora Francis, is five years old and she has Libra's congenital amaurosis and would benefit from Luxterna. Um, Nora was born um, in December of 2015. Um, everything was normal, full term. At five weeks, she developed nystagmus, which, well, we didn't know what nystagmus was at the time, but her eyes started rapidly moving up and down. So we took her to the IWK emergency, which is the children's hospital here in Halifax. And uh, we went into the um, emergency room and we had do emergency doctors come in and look at her and nurses come in and look at her and nobody knew what it was. And every time somebody else would come into the to the room, my husband and I, are, are it was a bad feeling because nobody knew what was going on. So they actually called up to neurology and sent her up there. And uh, they did an EEG um, to check her, her brain. And um, that was good. And then the neurologist there um, did a few little tests on her and said, um, you know, what I see is, is, a, is a baby who is severely visually impaired and uh, to prepare for lifelong blindness. So that was a bit of a shock. Um, and from there, he referred us to ophthalmology. And we, uh, so when we got home from that kind of emergency visit, um, it was, <laughs> of course, what any parent does is they start researching. So I researched and researched and researched and um, to learn how to look after a baby with a visual impairment. And then when I was doing research, I came across Libra's congenital amaurosis, and it seemed to line up with what was going on with her. However, um, which we now know kind of markers L, um, LCA type two is that her vision did improve. So she, by the time she was about six months old in good lighting, she was seen very well. Um, and so the, the diagnosis for her was actually leaning towards um, 
congenital stationary blind uh, night blindness. And so we liked the sound of that because we knew that that was not um, degenerative. And so, you know, stationary, woohoo. Um, anyways, it took us, uh, she had lots of tests done and at two and a half, she had an ERG done to check her, her uh, retinal function. And um, both um, her specialist was expecting that it would confirm the night blindness um, diagnosis, but however, um, it confirmed that she had Leber's congenital amaurosis. Um, she was actually quite surprised how well Nora was doing with her vision compared to the results of that ERG. Um, so from there, actually, it, it was quite quick. Um, they did warn us that genetic testing might take a while, but it uh, it was only a couple months, and then she did uh, she did it did confirm that it was type two. So this would have been in the fall of two thousand and eighteen. She was confirmed, and um, and of course we I mean we were happy that the the type she had actually had an approved uh, treatment in the states at that time. And so then, of course, you know, we started trying to advocate to, you know, how do we get our child to have this, you know, ha treatment? And of course, you do everything you say is, well, through a specialist, can she go to the States and get this done? What can she do? And um, so we, you know, all this for a couple of years, of course. And then, you know, we did, we tried to raise awareness about it. Uh, we did an article in the Halifax newspaper about her and about how um, the treatment wasn't available in Canada yet. And... Um, then in 2020, obviously it was approved here in, in Canada. And then of course we were very excited, but we ourselves didn't really know how long a process would take from that. So then we, of course, then it was a new journey of trying to write emails. And, um, then, uh, Doug Earl contacted me, which ended up feeling really good that we had other people behind us, um, that are that have been working tirelessly to try to get this treatment into Canada because I think with a parent of somebody who has a rare disease, you can feel very alone because you don't know anybody else who's experiencing this. And so he, when he reached out, and we did a article, uh, we did a little um, news uh, news blurb there at, in CTV, CTV, and uh, so that was great. And uh, yeah, uh, is there anything else? <laughs> Well, I, I think it's, you know, as a part of the case study, you know, here, here is a mom worried about her child, her baby, uh, you know, the toddler, and, and you know, Silke, you've been just amazing sharing your story with, with Canada, the CTV news story went across the country. You, you've had to navigate the system trying to get the best care uh, for your daughter, and so thank you, I mean, but it does say something about our system. Uh, that, that we've had to do it. I, I see Jack's chair. Uh, Jack, are you there? Uh, I am, Doug. Uh, yeah, please, please uh, add into our discussion. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity to share with all of you. Um, I am a person living with type 2 Leber's congenital amaurosis and, and like Nora, uh, could benefit from Luxterna. And it's so fascinating to me because Nora's story is so similar to mine except about 20 years apart um, the main difference with me is i didn't get genetic diagnosis until i was 16 years old and you know in my situation uh i've lost a lot of vision uh over the last you know 10 years uh, my vision was quite stable until about the age of 15 and it's you know decreased a lot i haven't been able to read uh, you know, a large print book for a long time. Um, I barely use my vision uh, other than for mobility and good lighting now. And Luxterna can still benefit me because it can help keep the vision that I do have, which I, you know, as, as impaired as it is, it's still something that, you know, makes a, a difference in my life. And, you know, throughout this process, uh, of waiting and waiting and, and trying to find every opportunity possible to get this treatment. Um, it, it just, it's been so uh, heartbreaking, I guess, to, you know, know that there's a treatment out there and know that, you know, I'm a person who's working full time, I'm contributing to society, I'm paying taxes, and that this isn't something that the government's 
you know, uh, been as fast on acting on as, you know, I would have liked. And uh, I'm really hopeful for children like Nora, because I know how well I could see when I was five years old. And, you know, being able to restore that level of vision uh, for someone is just will make such a huge difference. So I'm very hopeful that uh, we'll, we'll see some uh, progress soon. And hopefully that, uh, you know, I'll be able to benefit from the treatment as well. Back, I know uh, as someone living with this condition, knowing that there's a treatment there, you know, can you talk a little bit about the opportunity that you there, have uh, as with that talk experience to contribute to the decision-making process? Sorry, Doug, you cut out for a second. So I'm, I'm going to try and repeat what you said and, and just tell me if I am misquoting you. But you're, you're asking like uh, my involvement in the decision making process to share on that or? or... Yeah, but what inputs, you know, how have you felt about the opportunities yeah. that you've had to input into the system and, and share a, a, a lived experience a voice about the urgency of this for this yeah. treatment? Yeah, thanks for asking, Doug. And as someone living with this condition, I felt like I've been sidelined and that there's nothing that I can do to help make this process happen. Um, you know, Doug shared that FBC has done phenomenal work on, you know, building the case around this and uh, making it so that uh, the government's aware of how much this treatment can impact people's lives. And they've, they've done a great job, but myself as a patient, because of our system in Canada, I'm not able to share my experience. I'm not able to share, you know, how uh, this treatment can change my life as an individual. I'm, uh, you know, not able to add my voice and I've just got to sit there and wait and notice that my vision's getting worse. And it, it, it's terrible to, you know, feel like you're helpless and that there's nothing you can do. Um, I volunteer with some organizations that, uh, uh, help uh, do similar work to FBC in the United States, for example. And in the United States, patients and family members were able to testify as part of the approval process, which I believe in part really helped that process move along quickly because the stories of the patients and the families really made what this science had been, had been coming toward for so long and made it real. And we just, we haven't had that in Canada. And I think that's why we're on that list of six countries in part uh, uh, because, because of, you know, not having the patients involved. Dr. Eyal. Yes, thank you, Doug. Um, Jack has been an amazing advocate and we wish that we could clone Jack in, in many versions because the problem with visual impairment is that it's invisible and it's silent. Like people, you don't see someone who's visually impaired. Like visual impaired people, they figure it out. They're strong and that they suffer internally greatly. And uh, the fact that it's been a year that this has been approved and that nothing's happening, I personally find is unethical. And that's what we told Cadiz, that that nothing's been happening when you have a progressive degenerative disease where the impact on society, keeping someone active in the workforce, mentally well, because the effect on depression is, is extremely high, uh, is just absolutely not right. And we've been really lucky to have the support of Fighting Blindness Canada, who through the years, we've built a national registry and we're lined up, everyone's trained, the pharmacy's trained, surgeons are trained, patients are identified. We're just sitting there waiting. Sika, did you want to contribute to the discussion? No, I, fighting blend, I'm, I'm so glad that there is a registry for, for Nora um, to be on and we put it on, we put her on it right away. That was the first thing our specialist gave us when she gave us the diagnosis just of Libra's congenital amaurosis. We wrote, we put all the information in right away and it felt like at least we were, we were, we were doing something. Um, so I, it would be great if, if registry, like they were speaking before, if a registry could be made for a lot of, or a, a national registry for all these different genetic diseases, because I think that would, that's definitely helpful. 
And uh, Dr. Ayan, could you maybe share a little bit about around your colleagues and what they've been doing to try to get this treatment approved? Well, here, my yeah, medical colleagues. Canada. Yes. <laughs> um, well, you've not been, much. <laughs> well, you've been testifying, you've been sending letters, you've been uh, oh, working with well, the yeah. hospital administration. You know, well, I, ha I have I have Doug behind me. And um, so, uh, no, actually, that's not true. Like, through uh, Novartis has been kind in helping us form a national advisory board from the key specialists in the country. For now, there's three treatment centers identified. We've uh, written so many letters. Uh, I've been lucky after a year, the hospital is has been receptive in uh, trying to support us. But of course, we can't be at the forefront of the, of the request. Uh, I have had the privilege of having five patients treated in the early, early trial about 15 years ago. And in, in those days, you were treating the worst cases because people weren't taking any risk. It was still a phase one, two. And the kids still use their vision. And even though their effect may not have been great for them, when you see them, it's a major effect. And um, we've been managing to get the word out more through the support of Doug and through, I think I got, I built a, what was interesting is that what we've learned also through Novartis is that people just don't know how to manage this situation the hospital doesn't know and the government doesn't know. So we've built a team and I have to thank Brent for being part of that team that includes pharmacy business management, the OR business management, uh, the VP of operation, uh, myself, anyone we can think of who could have insight in decision-making and how can you reach out. But it's, it's a novel process and all these people didn't know each other. So it just came from me begging to one and then begging to another and then realized that, oh, all the, the key like stakeholders in this decision-making process don't know each other. So it's been very useful. And we meet regularly for updates. Doug managed to have a meeting with the high up at uh, Cadiz, which coincidentally a few days after uh, negotiations were starting, but I think, and anyway, as far as I'm concerned, we've tried everything. Yeah, that, and, that was the, and I that have was to be the, careful. <laughs> that 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 was the Pan Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance that we met. Their oh, government okay, council. sorry. Yeah, no problem. It's it, the system is uh, is Byzantine at the best of times, but uh, it's it's an easy mistake not to. You know, to confuse it all, which which again is another point why we need a rare disease strategy. So, Derhan, uh, our our time is uh, up, and I, and Bill, I, if you want to dialogue more or have any questions, we're we're happy to answer. This is great, Doug. I you know you led a lot of the uh, the, the Q and A among the panelists, um, and thank you for also contributing to the chat. I just want to highlight it for for you know those who. Um, uh, are not necessarily following it as closely that you've you've put the um, the website uh, approvalexterna.ca there um, and just a, I had a quick quick uh, look at it and it's it's very clear and it brings back from, from my reflection to our earlier conversation on on the roadmap and you know when you talk about provincial funding the the note is we're not there yet but I think if people visit that website which is super clear and explains what's happening on the specific issue um there's going to be a lot of people on the line among delegates and i'm thinking about you know kim and others at cystic fibrosis and uh um, so many other delegates who have been at different stages where you are now so i'm just hopeful um earl and and, and sitka and and um and, and jack and and, and uh, others that we're you know these opportunities to 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 share experiences and case studies like this are going to help others who are, are facing similar challenges, but hopefully to give you hope that um, that this can work, mm -hmm. that there are there there are ways to de-block the system at the right time, um, so that we you know uh, that we don't have 
more stories like Jack's where it's, it's a rapid progression. And that is why I'm really thankful for Durhan to have built this case study here in, into the agenda. Um, we are at time though. Um, so are, are there any final thoughts that you have, uh, Doug, to wrap up your reflections on your panel? No, well, th thank you, Bill, uh, for mentioning approvedlexterna.ca. And, you know, it, it, I, I think we've shared a little bit around both uh, our medical leaders uh, and, and two stories of lived experience around what you have to do to get uh, access to a transformational treatment in the current system and why the system has to change. But, but you know, we, we set up this website, we mobilized uh, 4,000 emails to get to this point where provinces are now negotiating. Uh, and now, now that we've re refreshed the website in the last three days, uh, because so please send an email, go on the website approvalexterna.ca, fill it out, send an email, uh, because we're really, unfortunately, we're trailblazing for gene therapies. Uh, you know, the system is not set up to deal with us. Uh, and, and so that all the treatments that are coming, we, we're tracking 70 new treatments uh, in the inherited space alone uh, around gene therapies that, that are coming. And so we, we really need to set the precedent that this is funded. So all those that follow will, will not have to go through what we're going through and, and Sitka and Jack don't have to, uh, you know, remove that, you know, be on a soapbox just to get a transformational uh, treatment to save their sight and not go blind. Thank, thank you so much, Doug, Elise, Jack, Sitka, um, and everyone on the line, uh, we see Dr. McMillan continuing to contribute to, to the chat as well. I, I'd, I'd encourage everyone out there to do the same. We've got a, um, so if you want to uh, step out, but don't go away, keep the conversation going. Uh, let's pretend this is a real conference. Pretend we're all in the same room right now and uh, let's keep it, keep it going. The next, um, the next theme. Thank you. Uh, the, the next theme we have is uh, how to create a competitive access environment for innovation. And it's really building on um, uh, some of the, the, the opportunities and challenges that we, we talked about earlier. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna kick off this panel with, uh, with uh, Eileen McMahon. And it's, it's great to see you, Eileen. Uh, hopefully next time in person, and the same goes for everyone. Uh, even I see several people who are in Ottawa and I haven't seen you in, in way too long. Um, and maybe I'll introduce the whole panel first and then bring it back to you, Eileen, to sort of set the stage for the discussion. Um, so Eileen is the par a partner uh, and chair of the Intellectual Property and Food uh, and Drug Regulatory Practices at, at Tories, um, based in Toronto, but really with a perspective on, uh, on what's happening uh, around the world. I think Tories still has an office in New York as well, right, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Wayne Critchley, uh, the Senior Associate at Global Public Affairs and really no stranger to CORD, a past chair of CORD. Uh, and in the past, he uh, executive director of the Patented Medicine Prices Review Board, uh, an executive at CADETH. Uh, and for, for uh, and right now he's at, at GPA. It's great to see you, Wayne. Uh, and thanks for coming back. Uh, we've got uh, Michael May. Um, again, uh, uh, Michael has been on, on CORD conferences in the past, CEO uh, at the Center for Commercialization of Regenerative Medicine. Um, and so thank you, Michael, for joining us. Uh, we've got Declan Hamill, um, looking at through the Hollywood squares, uh, squares and you're in the middle, Declan, um, Vice President of Policy, Regulatory, and Legal Affairs at Innovative, Innovative Medicines Canada. Uh, Dr. Angela Genge, I don't see Angela yet, uh, but uh, hopefully she'll be joining. Uh, Executive Director at the Clinical Research Unit uh, of the Montreal Neurological Institute, or as we fondly like to think of it, the neuro, uh, which reminds everyone of the incredible science that happens in Montreal on people's brains. Uh, we've got my friend Lorene Redding, uh, Head of Value Access and Policy at Beijing. It's great to see you, Lorene. Thank you for, for, for uh, joining us. Fred Little, uh, Country Lead for Rare Diseases at Pfizer. Fred, uh, thanks, thanks for joining. Um, and somebody else who's been participating a lot in the chat, um, Oksana Iliach. Thank you. It's great to see you. Uh, Senior Director of Regulatory Strategy and Policy at Synchrogenics and a member of the Board of Directors of CORD. So thank you, um, Oksana, for being here. Um, and of course, I see uh, Tammy Moore, uh, the CEO of the ALS Society of Canada. 
Uh, thank you, Tammy, Tammy, for joining us. There are a few people in the world who, and I always say this at court conferences, who is, is not a patient with ALS, but you have, you put me in the shoes and the mindset of imagining what it's like to be somebody with ALS better than anybody. So that's a, that's a, a real, um, to be able to do that sensitively and thoughtfully is such a gift. Uh, and to represent that community is, is, uh, is incredible. So thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Eileen to set the stage about the competitive or non-competitive access environment for innovation. Like what are, what's happening in Canada now? And then we're going to uh, open it up for discussion uh, and, and we'll, we'll do our best with so many people to get everyone's word in there. Eileen, over to you. We've got an hour. Go for it. Thank you kindly. Good afternoon, everyone. So nice to see all of you. Thank you, Durhan, for inviting me and Bill for kicking us off. Uh, looking forward to the input of my esteemed panelists. My perspective is a perspective of a lawyer who is often the first gateway for a company's decision whether to launch in Canada. I get calls where companies will say, uh, we make an orphan drug. We have launched or about to launch in the US, Europe, Japan, et cetera. We are considering Canada and here are our reservations. I'd like to take you through three buckets this afternoon and then my esteemed colleagues will be commenting on these buckets. The first bucket has to do with data protection. You might say, well, what, do, what does data protection mean and why is that relevant to manufacturers of orphan drugs? Data protection is something that exists completely independently of patents. And most countries of the world, the United States, Europe, Japan, Australia, the list is complete, India, on it goes, offer data protection for orphan drugs that is incredibly strong. So if you are bringing an orphan drug to the market for an orphan drug indication, you will have the comfort that you will have a period of exclusivity where a company cannot rely on your data to bring their drug to the market. So why is that relevant to a company? It's because it's one of the inputs. They put a lot of money into the clinical trials, of course, and the sample size is so small. There are so many hurdles. It's one of the first questions that is asked. Canada does not have a separate data exclusivity regime for orphan drugs. So that's, that's a hurdle. Um, we do have data protection for innovative medicines. And if an orphan drug meets that test, that's great. But many orphan drugs do not meet that test. That's the first point I wanted to make this morning. The second point has to do with PMPRB. And Wayne is going to give us his very deep perspective and wise perspective on Canada's patented medicines prices review board. The presentations from that board vis-a-vis -vis orphan rare drugs are scary. Just go search publicly, PMPRB, orphan drugs presentations, and they're dire. IMC, Declan uh, is here with us from IMC. There was a, a letter that they wrote commenting on the dire predictions of PMPRB vis-a-vis -vis pricing and orphan drugs. There have been other reports from Fraser Institute that have suggested that the pricing of orphan drugs is no different in terms of the spend for major countries as compared to the population. So we have a disconnect between the predictions of our pricing board, PMPRB, and reality. The other factor that goes into the PMPRB, this board rarely conducts hearings. But orphan drugs are the ones that are litigated. Look at Solaris. It's going up to the Supreme Court of Canada. So a company X Canada looks at this and is considering, is Canada a favorable environment? Horizon, Precisby, it's all over the PMPRB website. 
the amount of litigation that is going into the pricing of an orphan drug, that acts as a freeze in effect or a chilling effect when a company is kicking the tires vis-a-vis orphan drugs and launch in Canada. The third and last point that I'd like to make today, and a number of our excellent speakers today have commented on it. Uh, Frederick Lavoie has commented on our fragmented market access system. Dr. McMillan has commented on the time lag. Doug Earl has commented on the LOA and the duration. For non-orphan drugs, it's generally predictable now. People know this is the timeline for Health Canada approval. Here's the timeline for PMPRB. Here's the timeline for PCPA, CADETH, INS. We're going to, and they, they roll it out on the x-axis and we're involved in those predictable timelines. Hearing the timelines that Doug Earl has gone through. So a year and they're not even at the letter of intent yet. So, that is highly problematic in terms of market access, because once you have the letter of intent from PCPA, you can add on another four to six months to get individual product license agreements for the specific drug. So from a legal perspective, those are the three points that I wanted to say today to kick off our panelists. Very much look forward to the input of my esteemed colleagues. Thanks. Oh, Dr. Genge is here. Great to see you, Angela. Um, you know, and we're going to throw this up for, for, for discussion and in no straight order, but I, I would notice that you've got three themes um, and it seems a bit of a sandwich. Uh, you know, uh, start uh, to have a special framework for orphan drugs around data protection. That would be a signal. Stop uh, what you're doing on the PMPRB changes and start. Uh, improving the access pathway so that there is a real clear pathway to market access. So um, out, out to anyone who wants to kick us off here, this is uh, a bit of a fishbowl and you all have extensive expertise and experience um, at different stages of this. Um, please react to, uh, to Eileen. And I see Fred in, in the middle and, and Wayne, then you're at X because I heard you trying to get off mute, but you were on mute for a second. So Fred and then Wayne. Yeah, I just thought, uh, I mean, I have, I have some thoughts that I wanted to share, but I just building off what Eileen had commented. So what's quite interesting, we're in the middle of a, of, of a uh, consultation with Health Canada on a Canadian framework for rare disease. Actually, if you look at Europe, uh, and Eileen mentioned, so 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, they actually developed their first framework for rare disease. And, and what's interesting, they had three principles. One was around, you know, what is a rare disease per se and the policy framework to put in place, regulatory framework to be able to assess that. The second was what Eileen had talked about was the incentives. Uh, and from that, I think other molecules and therapeutic areas actually benefit from when that legislation came in. And then thirdly is around, you know, their development of an organization or committee actually looking at rare diseases. That being said, you know, they built that framework. Uh, uh, rare disease have been able to to benefit from that, but their work is not done because if you look at really the literature and you look at uh, the news, they're now kicked off in I think the last six to, uh, to nine months, they're phase two of another rare disease framework. So we're already talking about things that were talked about 20 years ago, you know, in Europe, just to get caught up. Uh, so I think some of the things that, you know, um, Eileen highlighted is low hanging fruit that we can actually get done because other jurisdictions have done it. Anyway, I just wanted to kind of put my my two thoughts on supporting that that particular uh, key points that uh, Alin had uh, had commented on. Thanks, Fred. Uh, Wayne. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. First, uh, I really do want to thank uh, Durhan for putting this conference together. It's a very uh, very powerful uh, conference, I must say, and, and I'm always amazed how after all these years one can still learn so much by attending a court event and hearing, especially hearing directly from the patients and, and, their, and their families. Um, thank you, Eileen, for that great uh, uh, introduction. And, and uh, as you indicated, I was asked to speak in particular to the PMPRB aspect of this. And, and I think it's important because to me, a PMPRB file is the elephant in the room. It's very difficult to sit down and talk about any of these other issues when that is hanging over everything. 
and and I think it's really important that we try and 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 and, uh, and address that. And I think Cord has has done a lot to do that. So you know what uh, what what are the pr the problems with the with the PNPRB reform? There's no agreement. Uh, 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 and there's no consensus. Uh, uh, I didn't get into it, but the legal validity of the PNPRB itself, in particular of the reform proposals, is up in the air. It's in the courts. Litigation is going to go on for several years. There has been inadequate consultation. Just ask her hand. Does she think she was heard any time in this process? We know that every submission from ministry was pretty well swept aside and uh, not taken into account. It's certainly not answered uh, in the PNPRB's responses. The proposals are so complex. There are very few people who can understand them and they change. Uh, and as a result, uh, it's, it's left folks in, in industry trying to respond, scratching their heads, trying to figure out how to manage and plan their business activities in the next few years uh, without greater clarity and certainty about the, about the rules of the game. So just that uncertainty alone will contribute to the litigation going forward. But even worse than that is the way the system is set up, it encourages litigation. And, and, uh, and let's not forget something. PMPRB is the only, the only system in the entire world that relies on a legal quasi-judicial process to review drug prices. It's the only one. In other cases, they're virtually all connected to the reimbursement uh, uh, system, like PCPA, for example. That's how they're connected. It's not a legal process where you go to court. And, and there was a reference earlier to the uh, uh, Soliris case that uh, began in the PNPRB over six years ago, but even at that point, uh, that drug had been on the market for about five or six years at a price that had been agreed to and negotiated with provincial governments. So here we are, what, about 12 years in, I guess, and, th and that case is still uh, going forward into the courts and it's, it's unresolved. I don't know how that helps patients. And, and I just have so much sympathy for uh, those families who are impacted uh, by uh, cases such as that one. Huge financial risk for companies uh, uh, in, this, in this uncertain market, but the PNPRB's own estimates are that for some rare disease drugs, prices would have to be lowered by 90% uh, over what they, what they have been otherwise. And all of this in a framework where the PNPRB's own reports show that it has achieved its objectives of keeping Canadian prices in line uh, with prices internationally. Uh, this is part, part of the, the challenge as well. Like what problem are we trying to fix exactly? And another element, again, that no one has, has touched on really, but that has arisen uh, in, in the course of the last four or five years of this uh, debate is we have come to see a very significant bias on the part of the PNPRB. Remember what I said earlier, it's a court, it's a tribunal. It's supposed to be the honest broker. Uh, and, and that's how the system was set up actually. It was set up as, a, as an honest broker uh, to uh, uh, address pricing issues in a fair and unbiased way. Well, the PMPRB more and more through its activities is showing a very strong and negative bias uh, towards the pharmaceutical industry and towards anyone who they think uh, thinks the same way as the pharmaceutical industry. In, in my view, th this kind of approach is totally incompatible with the quasi-judicial body and is going to lead to even more challenges uh, going forward. So it's, it's a very untenable situation. We are now less than a month away from coming into the coming into effect of new regulations and guidelines. And I don't think there's anybody out there who, who, who has a clue as to whether this is going to actually go ahead or whether it's going to be delayed yet again uh, for the fourth time uh, as, as government tries to sort out the solution. So what, what are the options for government? And, and I think we uh, need to have some sympathy uh, for uh, the government today as they try to figure out what, what to do. And I think there's essentially, very simply put, there are three options. One is you just let it go ahead, damn the torpedoes and see what happens. Uh, the second would be to abandon it completely, just walk away, say, look, we, we realize we made a mistake, we've got to rethink this, and, and we're not going to proceed with it. 
that second option is as as attractive as it is for many of us uh, is hard. It's hard to see how that is politically palatable for a government that in, uh, initially was elected the first time, saying that they were going to lower drug prices. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I think that's a, something that many people would like to see, but it's highly unlikely. So there's a need to come up with some solution, some compromise, some alternatives to what's on the table. And, and to do that, there also, I think, has to be a mechanism to do that. There, and, and, and it's hard to see right now that that is happening. And maybe it's happening behind the scenes. We can all hope so. But it's hard to see how that's happening and how it uh, can happen successfully. So I think this is an opportunity for all of us who have an interest and concern about this to, uh, to think about how, how, can, how can we help? Uh, can CORD help? Uh, and I think CORD has uh, already on many occasions put forward suggestions and proposals to uh, resolve the impasse. I think the work that CORD is doing on the rare disease strategy is so tremendously important and does help to provide a very important um, uh, uh, attempt to address the concerns that led to the PMPRB reform in the first place. So that's an important role. But is there more? So I challenge the rest of the folks on this uh, panel. Is there more that we can do? How can we bring this, this uh, problem to a, a satisfactory solution? Thanks, Wayne. That's great. Um, I'm going to keep it a bit of a speaker's list now. Uh, we're going to go to Tammy and then Declan and Lorreen. Over to you, Tammy. Thanks, Bill. And thank you to Derhan for this opportunity to bring forward some of the perspective of the ALS community. And Bill, to your point about how I previously referenced ALS, it is a progressive terminal illness where people um, experience paralysis to the point where they are unable to move their body, eventually to be able to speak, to be able to swallow in terms of being able to eat, to communicate. Um, and eventually they lose their ability to breathe. And so in many ways, ALS could be considered, you know, a very much a disease of unmet need. And we've now seen the first drug that started through Health Canada approval in 20 years went through about three years ago. And last week, um, it was interesting to have it be a celebration of sorts that the drug finally got through the last provincial uh, formulary. And it seemed how, um, how inappropriate given that in that time, 3000 Canadians have died of ALS and not had access within that province. And so that was the first therapy that we saw. And when we think about the different ways that that therapy came through, because it was a repurposed drug, we actually saw people bring it through, through personal importation and then through a special access program that was opened up by the company and then trying to get it through the regular process. What we now have is a second therapy that's coming through the process um, and we were surprised because actually the company applied to Canada before any other country. And we thought, excellent, here we go. And then it wasn't granted a priority review because it didn't met, meet the standard or unmet need in our country. And so once again, we've taken that time frame right out of the gate from six months to a year. And that's Health Canada. And again, to that point of, and what will be the time frame thereafter? So we have been doing some work to be able to find alignment and to be able to put forward recommendations based upon the global ALS community. Because once again, even though our community doesn't like to consider themselves a rare disease, the reality is the small population has so many consistencies amongst how the clinical trials, the numbers that are considered and all of those. So our international organization is trying to work together to collectively move forward these issues to see if there's some sort of alignment that uh, other regulatory bodies can have with Health Canada, with Australia, with the US and with other countries that could be considered. So those are some of the things that we have been giving thought to as we're trying to move these issues forward and very much identifying within the ALS community, some of the challenges that are there. Um, thanks, Tammy. Uh, uh, Declan, uh, what, what do you see in this and, and maybe to, to Wayne's challenge to everybody, you know, what can we do about it? First of all, thanks, um, Bill, and uh, thanks to Duran and to Cord for inviting me to speak on the panel. And uh, Eileen, I think you did a really good job on setting up the spectrum of issues from 
the IP issues and data protection and HTA and regulatory approvals and PMPRB. There, there are a lot of things that could be improved. There's no doubt about that. And if we had a five hour long panel, we might get to all of them, but we don't. Um, so I, I guess I'd start off by, by you know, dealing with the clear and, and present danger and, and sort of echoing a lot of the things that Wayne said. I mean, you know, the PMPRB's regime, um, this is a, a complete public policy failure. This, this regime was con, you know, originally conceived in 2016. It's, it's been going on you know, now almost into 2022. There's still no end in sight to this. There's no, no one will, really knows what will happen on January 1st. So this has been going on for years. We're now on our fourth health minister dealing with this, this mess. And you know, what I can say though is, you know, there may be people you know, in the audience who say, well, of course Declan would say that. He works for, for the big pharma guys and it's in his interest to block regulatory reforms. Um, but I want to assure everyone that, you know, we have tried on repeated occasions to talk to the government about alternative proposals that we think um, would achieve some costs, rationality, but at the same time would not block the entry of uh, innovative medicines into the country, including new DRD treatments. And the new economic factors, which I'm not going to get into on this panel, uh, that are part of PMPRB's regulations are a real problem for the introduction of new medicines uh, into the country. I spoke to a, a general manager of a small Canadian company last week who's wondering how he's going to launch his product in Canada given the new economic factors. Uh, the week before I spoke to somebody from a larger multinational company who's echoing the same concerns and you know wondering what's going to happen on January 1st. And you know, this has now been going on for, for a very long time. But I, I think you know we need to somehow break out of this cycle of of, uh, of of dealing with the PMPRB and its reforms and try and get, if we can, it may be a bit idealistic, to a space where we go. Well, what actually does benefit patients? What benefits the health system? What will allow industry to introduce products into Canada? You know, PMPRB is admittedly kind of a made in Canada challenge, um, as was alluded to. Nobody else really adjudicates pricing in the world uh, in the same manner, kind of um, disentangling access and, and, and pricing. PMPRB you know, is, has a very narrow mandate. Um, as was also noted, this tends to end up with a lot of work for lawyers, which is great if you're a lawyer, but not great if you're a patient or, or anybody else. And, and I think you know, hopefully with a new health minister, and there's an acting new acting chair in PMPRB, and you know all of the time that has gone alluded, uh, I alluded to that has gone uh, through the system. You know, I think this is a time to sit down and really consider what would work best for patients. And you know, I I, I commend the work of Michelle Boudreau and others at Health Canada who are working uh, on that DRD initiative. Uh, you know, with modest first step. I also commend the work of of people like ADM Sabouré working on agile regulations to improve product approvals and efficiencies in Canada. And they've learned a lot from COVID. However, there's a complete disconnect with what some folks at Health Canada are doing and the PMPRB reforms. And we, you know, we always have to collectively remind them that there's a dissonance here, uh, that they're, they're, you know, we cannot have, it, it, it's, it's not meaningful to have efficiencies in a regulatory system if people don't have any kind of business case for, for bringing a product here. And lastly, I just leave you with, um, you know, uh, I think kind of proof positive that even PMPRB may know this is an issue. It didn't get a lot of attention because the new regulations and guidelines didn't go into effect. But, but some time ago, in the context of COVID vaccines and treatments, PMPRB put out a statement, an assurance statement saying, uh, you know, should the new regime come into effect, um, we will not apply. Uh, these factors, these this new regime, uh, to COVID vaccines and and, and treatments, uh, and this is almost an admission that they know this would have caused access issues. But the question there is, that's great. It's it's fine that they did that, but but you know why is why why the special treatment? Other products will be similarly disadvantaged, whether they're DRD products or oncology products or other products by this new regime. So PMPRB has pretty well demonstrated that even they know 
that this new system is going to cause uncertainty and it's going to either stop product launches or delay product launches. So, you know, job number one is to ensure that this regime doesn't go into effect uh, on, on January 1st. And job number two is let's have an adult conversation about an alternative to this. I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop my rant there. We're going to bring it over to Lorene in, in just a second, but one idea, because I think we want to start thinking about, you know, this would be the fourth delay, I think, Wayne, right? We've had three, so three six-month delays. Could you actually suspend the implementation date completely in for January? And the, they would still remain on the books. The regulations would still be there, but would that open up a little bit more time so that we're not you know, just looking ahead in six month in increments, because my image for this is like, remember the Looney Tunes cartoons with an anvil? It's on a very thin string and we don't know if it's gonna break or, or go away. Um, and so I think that that's a bit of, of the challenge is to deal with the, the, the uncertainty of that anvil. Um, for those of you who watched Looney Tunes growing up, which Loreen, I know you didn't because you're much younger than me, but over to you. Um, Bill, I can always leave it to you to bring in Looney Tunes. And <laughs> no, I'm not that much younger than you. And uh, yes, I do remember Looney Tunes. And actually, when I think about PMPRB some days, I think that it's uh, somewhat uh, Looney Tunes like. So a, a good metaphor analogy. Um, I did want to thank Cord and uh, uh, and Verhan for inviting me to participate in this panel. Uh, you know, CORD is a real champion for patients, and, uh, and we all are. I think Declan, Wayne, and Eileen have spoken about many of the points that I was hoping to cover, so I won't reiterate that. Uh, but I do want to share with you my perspective. Um, I have been an industry representative at the PMPRB table and the steering committee. Um, I'm also a caregiver of a patient with a rare disease. This week, um, I celebrated, uh, and I say celebrated, uh, my sister's passing. And it's been 10 years uh, since she succumbed to her, um, her rare disease, a genetic disorder. I've spent my entire career working in the industry and advocating on behalf of patients. And it's really ultimately about patient values that should be considered in everything that we do. They need to be at the forefront of decision-making at all levels. Accessibility and affordability considerations are foremost. Um, you know, as a representative of an organization, Beijing, which is new to Canada, we have a purposeful mission that includes both accessibility and affordability as two key pillars underpinning our mission. Um, you know, and, and as a caregiver, but also somebody who's worked in the industry, it's challenging. The system itself has become far more complex and yet less so meeting the needs of the, the patients today than it did yesterday. You know, we have so many stakeholders with diverse interests and bias that impact access to new innovative therapies. And they're not necessarily based on information or data. You know, I do think, you know, what was covered this morning in terms of the 12 principles is critical to think about. And it does un underpin uh, what would make a, an important a step towards a framework, a rare disease framework in Canada. For me, their value-based assessment, pricing negotiations, and access parameters that fit the local needs and local needs of patients. Um, like Wayne and others that have spoken about it, when the government announced its delay, its third delay to implementing the patented medicines prices regulations, I too celebrated that moment. I think we need to pause and reconsider what makes sense. Uh, we need to create less infrastructure, less bureaucracy, and more action. We need to focus on what matters to patients and not what is creating just redundancy within the system. And for me, it's really around you know, looking at the myriad of stakeholders that have heterogeneous interests 
and really contemplating the reason why we're all sitting around a table. And our table should not have four corners. It should be round. We should be having an active conversation as one group of interested stakeholders trying to solve the same problem. We need to make meaningful progress towards a real rare disease framework and seriously setting aside the outdated systems as Wayne has outlined and seriously look at appropriate options that allow us to create a fit for purpose rare disease framework in Canada. Excellent. That's a great call out, Lorene, and, and, and really appreciate you wrapping it back around to, to Eileen's, uh, you know, um, uh, third theme, especially, which is the, there are other bumps on the road. Uh, Oksana, you got your hand up, and I just want to make a note that um, uh, we've got Dr. Genj somewhere out there, too, who can come back on as well. It'd be great to hear from you. And time check, we've got about 20 minutes left. So just heads up there. Oksana, over to you. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you, Eileen, for summarizing those hurdles in such a perfect way. And as a court member, to be honest with you, I always very excitedly celebrate success stories. And we've heard some of the success stories today. But on the other hand, every time when I heard about problems that the patients experience with regards to the access um, and even participations in the clinical research, I feel personal responsibilities. And also being a regulatory professional, I like to kind of always make thoughts a little bit narrow and similar to what you outline in the hurdles, I'm thinking more of, of how we strategically have to think about connections, transitions, and motivations. Uh, we have a lot of success in the different areas, uh, starting with the development drug, uh, finishing with the approval, but we have a problem of transitioning our patients from one stage to another, as well as the transitioning to the actual access and the connections between the patients, researchers, industry, and the payers is also broken. We don't have that straight connections between those different people. And the last piece is the motivation, of course. The motivations for the companies to bring the product, first of all, as a part of the clinical research to Canada, and that will become part of our uh, kind of involvement in the earlier drug development to the access, uh, motivating of the access to the drug and bringing the product to, to actually being available in Canada. So from that perspective, I think this, our strategical approach should be a little bit more of, of bringing it all together and making sure we involved with the patients, companies, payers, and all the major stakeholders. Thanks so much, Oksana. And I, Fred, before we go to you, I just want to give um, an opportunity for, for Dr. Genj to weigh in. And thank you for coming back. And I haven't seen Michael May, if he's around too, but, uh, and then we'll, we'll come back to you, Fred. So Angela, what are you seeing after uh, all of this conversation this morning and, and into the afternoon? Apologize, Bill. I was having lunch and didn't think you needed to watch that. Um, been listening all along. So, Obviously, I would agree with virtually every speaker here. Uh, I see another effect that we really haven't talked about, which should resonate with our government. I'm not sure what platform we can use to remind them of this. Is the There is a um, ripple effect of PMPRB, which goes beyond the crucial access to medication for rare disease patients um, in uh, for a, approved therapies. And that ripple effect is it then creates or um, increases what is already present, uh, which is a reluctance for drug de development, uh, which is the pre-approval process in which a lot of our rare disease patients get access to drugs when they're in development um, at no cost to themselves and at no cost to the government. The, the sponsors carry all the costs related to drug development, as you know. Life sciences is an important industry in this country. And we have already paid the price um, in the last two years for having let 
let our vaccine um, independence, uh, autonomy, I think is the word, uh, lapse and put us at the mercy of other countries uh, to get access to the COVID vaccine. With what the PMPRB is attempting to do, we could see that effect expand well beyond vaccines. Um, the company, uh, sponsors of clinical trials go into regions where ultimately they expect they will eventually go to for approval. There is work done. Um, there's benefits to a company or a sponsor to choose a region which will ultimately be a place where they, they provide their drug. To make this an, an impossibility, we'll have this major ripple effect on a major industry in Canada. And we will take what was uh, mostly considered a vaccine manufacturing problem and expand that well beyond vaccines. And it will hit all of the new drugs being developed for rare diseases. So I guess my perspective is just slightly different. It's taking approval and looking at everything that's impacted once you screw up approval. And there's a huge tail to this that, that has a, puts an industry at risk in addition to the patients who are benefiting. Such a, an interesting perspective and it actually builds on something that's in the chat group and might even lead to where you might go, Fred, potentially, because it, this is, um, I think, a question out to the, the developers who sponsor the clinical trials to begin with. Uh, there, there's a, an attempt to bring a, a new drug trial to Canada, and it's very difficult. Um, and there's there's something globally called the Helsinki Declaration, whereby you you really shouldn't be doing a clinical trial in a jurisdiction where there's no intention to make it more widely commercially available. So, are are these some of the difficult decisions or, or challenges happening at, at at the tables that you're around? Fred, in terms of where to, to, to bring clinical trials? Are you, are you hearing anything like that to, to build on what, what uh, Angela said and what we're hearing in the chat? Uh, so I'll respond to that question and kind of go to a couple of comments I wanted to kind of add to the discussion. So first of all, Bill and uh, Durhan, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so I think the short question is, is yes, those discussions are happening. I think when you look at individuals such as myself and others that you've seen on the rare disease, even though we belong to an international company, uh, and I can, I can speak for myself at least, our role is also to be an advocate for Canadians and knowing the roadblocks that are in place to try and help where we can to navigate so that we can bring these innovations to the Canadian marketplace. So, so I just don't want to, it's not really black or white, but when you're competing on a national market for clinical trials, the, on the one hand, we have great expertise and minds, so they want to come to Canada. On the other side is, as you talk about, access to medications afterwards, because you do set up an expectation when you bring clinical trials in that then a greater group of the population may get you know, access. And if that's not there or it's delayed, of course, companies will consider going, going other places. But, but I want to say we do, we do advocate. The other point that I wanted to make, Bill, is going back to one of the questions you had around vaccines, uh, which is you know, near and dear to our heart. So on the glass half full perspective, I think what we've seen is, is regulatory jurisdictions, Health Canada, FDA and EMA, approving drugs in record, approving these medications in record time between each other. So we're not looking at months and years to approval. In some cases, we're looking at days. So the good news is that there is a template and a willingness so how do we bring that willingness to rare disease? And the second point I wanted to make is that we need to make, and I think our advocacy is one that rare disease by its definition of rare needs a rare, dedicated and tailored review process. Because when, you, when we heard about PCPA, when we hear about IP, these are 90 issues. These are things that when I joined the industry in 1990, we're evolving over there. Like we're, and what we're bringing to the forefront is now innovative, actually pioneering. We talked, you know, Brent and uh, my colleague, Fred Lavoie talked about gene therapy. We're talking about advanced therapies. We're talking about cell therapies. These are novel innovations that, you know, there are very little pathways that exist currently. And we need to have an environment that's open to how do we open the pathway as opposed to closing the pathway. So 
Uh, I mean, there's more discussion on, on, you know, as Declan said, we could be here for five hours and get into solving all of those. But I wanted to kind of highlight that we could, we need to push uh, the different government, semi-government um, departments to be open to innovation and how to tailor that, but also at the same time for manufacturers, we're stepping up to do our best to try and solve that as well. Thanks so much, Fred. Does anyone else want to jump in? Uh, um, noting that we've we've had a lot of di uh, discussion on the PMPRB issue, I think it'd be great to pick up on theme one, which was, you know, everything from newborn screening to registries. Um, but if we can't solve for some of these downstream translational issues, including the anvil, but let's talk a little bit more about you know, that PCPA challenge that was brought up in the case study that we talked about, we heard about in Luxterna, um, you know, what can we do with, with the rest of, of the, the, the country's challenges? Uh, like Fred, you're, you're saying we need one system at the national level. Where are the provinces in all of this? Like, you know, how can the provincial um, government step up? Is this solution totally in Ottawa's hands or, or does it have to happen in Quebec City? Uh, Victoria and Toronto as well. Uh, I'd love to hear, although I'm in Ottawa, I like Ottawa. Uh, Declan, uh, over to you. You can solve yep. Canada. Uh, no, I don't think we have enough time for that. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it, it's, it's an important point. I mean, we live in a federation that has a lot of benefits in terms of allowing people to govern themselves in, in, in different ways in different regions. And, and sometimes, you know, people talk about federalism as a laboratory and good solutions can come from one place and then be applied elsewhere, but sometimes it does cause a lot of gridlock and a lot of a lot of issues. And you know, PCPA is 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 one which is also a really significant concern because you know this is an organization which is kind of it doesn't it's not a legal entity. It, it's sort of a loose you know sort of alliance of public drug plans. Uh, I know they're currently in the process of um, of I guess uh, sort of uh, reconsidering their governance model. And I don't know what will come out of that, but there's not a lot of transparency in PCPA's activities. Um, kind of like PMPRB, it's sort of off on the periphery of health ministries. And I'm not sure how much outside of the drug plans, even within provincial and territorial health departments, if, if it gets a lot of mind share. Um, but, but it does, it's, it's a crucial part of the system because you know, they do act as the, uh, as, as the bargaining agent for the public drug plans. And, you know, the performance of PCPA in terms of dealing with the backlog of submissions, uh, you know, was, was a problem even before the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has made things worse. Um, we have some, some graphs and statistics on the um, IMC website to support this. I mean, within the access continuum in Canada, Health Canada, HTA agencies, provincial agencies, PCPA is increasingly becoming uh, an issue in terms of the time that it takes to address products. And, you know, I think it's a mechanism um, which uh, saved governments a lot of money by doing price volume agreements on more conventional drugs. Uh, I, I think it's very badly suited for dealing with, with drugs for rare diseases, uh, specialty products, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of work to do there. And I, I think that, you know, to the, the extent that there's more transparency uh, shed on PCPA, and its activities, not just by industry, but by patient groups and others, I think it's really worthy of, of, a, of a discussion because it, it occupies a, an important but not particularly well understood place in the Canadian reimbursement system. There is plenty of room for improvement in it. And you know, as industry, we've approached PCPA and we proposed a number of efficiencies. We proposed innovative framework agreements uh, on, on risk sharing models. Uh, et cetera, that, um, that we'd like them to consider um, so far to, to not much avail. So it's going to take a medium to long-term effort. It won't happen overnight, but I think PCPA really deserves everybody's time and attention. Um, you know, notwithstanding the pandemic, patients still need access to life-saving and life-improving treatments. And, and you know, we, uh, we want to work with PCPA. We, we don't want to to, to, to say it's, it's, it's all their fault. Uh, industry has an important role to play in these negotiations. Uh, but I think it's, um, it's definitely a part of our system which needs more 
uh, transparency, and and there's plenty of room for improvement. So we're we're talking about um, dealing with some current obstacles. Uh, I also want to flip this a little bit, and maybe this would would help. Um, wasn't it the bare naked ladies who sang a song? If I had a billion dollars, or maybe it was some version of that. If you had a billion dollars, see, I've got Looney Tunes, the bare naked ladies coming in. Um, what what would you do with that to resolve some of these issues? We've seen just before the election uh, that, that Prince Edward Island signed on to improve access to reduce deductibles, um, and we've heard that some rare disease drugs are actually going on to the formulary on the island. So, okay, you have a billion dollars minus 35 million maybe. Where else would you spend it? What else would you do to uh, to improve access? And Eileen, I, got, I see you, it's great. Thanks for pitching in. Thank you, Bill. I come back to the to point about push and pull and we, we spoke about COVID and there we saw government pulling. They wanted these vaccines. They were going to remove the barriers. This was going to get done. PMPRB sidestepped. We'll, we'll, we're going to get this done. What I would like to see, Bill, if I had the billion dollars, is a champion within federal and provincial governments that wants to get this done. It clearly can be done. And currently, it's just not being addressed. So if I had a billion dollars, I'd find the champion and say, get this done. Excellent. And would that be like, an, uh, we heard earlier somebody say IMI, and something we should have started with was like, free, be careful with acronyms, because not everyone knows that that's the Innovative Medicines Initiative in, in Europe. Uh, it's a public private consortium. Not everyone you know, thinks that it's, it's the best thing since sliced bread. But is there an opportunity for a forum where, where the, you know, everyone is around the table that, that you described, Laureen, that's, that's a little bit rounder um, and where people aren't pointing fingers, they're actually, you know, trying to put themselves in the place of, of the other person and come to, come to a solution. Um, yeah, is there, is there something like that? Uh, Eileen, are you volunteering to lead this organization, by the way? I absolutely, I would play a role in it. And I like deadlines and I'd like to get work done. So I would not have an open amorphous think tank. I would want to drive to a solution by a particular date. At the end of the day, we may not be entirely happy with the solution, but we would be further ahead compared to where we are now. And we have so many data points ex Canada that we can leverage and learn from that to me with all of the brains here and in government, I it just blows me away that we have Canadians suffering the way we've heard today. Yeah, uh, thanks. Well, we have a volunteer for it, for it to be part of that uh, and hopefully to bring it forward. So thank you, Eileen. Anyone else want to jump in to, to, to build on that, uh, on, the, on the billion dollar question and, and what to do with it? It's something that Durhan asked us all to think about. So, um, you know, I would buy your love as the bare naked ladies would, but um, what would you do with it for rare disorders? No takers? Wayne, you're never on the on the, a wallflower. Jump in. Well, uh, first of all, I, I would definitely vote for Eileen for health minister, uh, federally or provincially. Eileen, you've got at least one vote. Um, yeah, no, I, I think I think you know I, to be really positive on this. I think the rare disease uh, program, the whole the policy initiative at the federal government. Uh, provides a really good example. And, and I know Durhan and, and others are working really hard uh, with Health Canada on this. If we can do a good job of putting that together here, because there we really are talking about intergovernmental uh, uh, partnership with uh, uh, all stakeholders. And if we can put together a, a, an appropriate uh, workable uh, 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 case there, then that can help be a model for uh, of the other parts of the system. And and because uh, obviously we have to look at all of those elements of pricing, reimbursement, timelines, et cetera. Uh, and importantly, a stakeholder uh, consultation and engagement, patient engagement. So 
I, you know, optimistically, I think, I think, I think Corn is doing the right thing by pushing and working so hard on that front. Uh, and it would be nice to see if it can provide some good uh, examples uh, to, to address other areas. And, and she is looking at um, either matching contributions or other support from, from other stakeholders. So she wants to see this leverage as well. I'll, I'll make that point, point too, because that was uh, something that Durhan regularly brings up. Uh, Lorena, I think you had your hand up. Uh, I did have my hand up and uh, it was covered in the chat room, but I think it's important on data. So the, the registries and uh, access to, to data in these uh, rare patient populations that can be used to have meaningful conversations. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Lorene. Theme one uh, panelist, Thierry, is back with, with your hand up. And, and this is something that we should, you know, we, we've got until two. So um, we are going to not end this panel formally. If you have, if some of the panelists have to drop off at 1:45, we had to stop there, so that's to respect your time. But um, the chat group has been great. Feel free to be like Thierry at this point. Uh, raise your hand and contribute. But Thierry, over to you. Great to have you back from my turn. Oh, I was here, so I listened very carefully. No, you were talking about uh, uh, matching funds and contributions. Uh, so last week at our assembly, we actually discussed uh, with uh, our executive the you know, this concept of uh, uh, clinical trial infrastructure that, you know, could uh, be, uh, you know, targeting and focusing on rare disease. And maybe, you, may, you may not know, but at each of our institutions, uh, um, Children's Hospital Foundation are actually uh, uh, spending and putting a lot of money uh, to uh, support the uh, local infrastructure. And it's uh, millions of dollars all over the Canada spent by you know, people giving money, so caritative institutions to support uh, uh, our clinical research on the ever. And it has always been to me, a, a, you know, a, a, an issue because uh, why we are requesting by CHR to provide matching funds for SPORE network or SPORE unit, whereas this same amount of money spent locally is never matched by federal or provincial dollars. So this is something that we could, you know, you know, consider as, uh, if we were moving forward with uh, an infrastructure to support clinical trial, that there is already a lot of money spent locally that, you know, um, could be considered kind of, uh, of a matching contributions. Excellent, thank you. And just um, a shout out to the chat. I really appreciate some of the comments. Um, around the provinces looking for health transfers to mitigate budget growth uh, and protect against the higher than expected uptake in some smaller provinces. And that's, uh, as you can see there, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, someone in, in Shediac, uh, New Brunswick. So one of the smaller provinces that, that is, and, and thank you. And actually, we've got people from across the country. So sometimes uh, these discussions get they can they can get to be Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal centric, and just really appreciate hearing from people um, from from the from the coast and, and central Canada as well. Um, building an army of educated and empowered patients that can help reshape the healthcare system governance by requesting a certain level of care. Uh, thank you, Sylvia, for that comment. Uh, and and you know I've heard it actually from several of the panelists now, and maybe I could, we could bring it back to you know, Tammy and, and, and the patients here, um, you know, if the money followed the patient, if the patient had more control over their journey, um, would the system be different rather than these gatekeepers for the money, not just the money, but the, the you know, the access down the line, like, can there be more patient empowerment uh, that, that, that could help, um, you know, get through some of the, 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 these barriers? Is, is there something there there? I think so. And we see that even within the care models where um, even within the province of Ontario, we've got different programs that allow people to manage their own care through, through um, money that can be provided to them versus the services being given to them. So it's a bit of a different model. And I think that there is something to be said for that, which would have a very different approach for how we would consider it. Again, the consideration that, you know, it's, once again, we're focusing just on the cost of therapies. We're not considering the overall cost of care in the absence of those therapies either. So there's so much more when you look at it from, the, from that different lens of a very specific patient perspective. Yeah, 
Thanks very much. Any any final thoughts from this um, this super panel? Uh, when we were live in person, Durhan would call this a fishbowl. I don't know if you remember that. It would actually be a, like almost a semicircle in front of the conference, and now it's Hollywood Squares with a whole bunch of people. A any closing thoughts? Maybe you know, Eileen, you kicked it off with the presentation. Did we manage to navigate? We didn't talk about data protection, but thank you for for explaining that. I think Fred picked up on that. We need a definition for rare diseases in Canada that we don't have actually formalized in, in that framework. So I think, what do you think, Eileen? Did, did we manage to pick up on a lot of what you, what you started with? Well, I think it, it's terrific. And we're going to pass over to Durhan, but I love the idea of a call to action. And with the various stakeholders involved here, doing our best as a team to move the dial in a substantial way. So data protection, PMPRB, market access, three levels together. PMPRB, as Wayne indicated, seems to be the elephant in the room, but together this collective team can move the dial substantially. So Durhan, I'd suggest over to you for the call to action. All of us are willing to help. Excellent. And, and actually we've seen so many calls to action even from this. And when we say action, it means specific um, initiatives that can be undertaken in in the short term uh and tomorrow and you know I, i'd love to be able to say over to durhan and, and uh unfortunately she's been unable to join us um to, to, to help with that but what i will do is i'll, I'll call up um uh, tomorrow's uh, uh agenda um in the few minutes remaining you know thank you so much all of you for your expertise your your commitment uh um and your, your experience, um, it really built on the case study uh, that came before uh, and the committee, you know, to, the, to, to fight blindness in that case for Luxterna uh, and, and theme one as well in terms of some of the, the, the glue. And Thierry, thank you for you not leaving and for joining us again to say, hey, here's where we can spend some money too. This has been great. I think that this is the beginning of um, uh, an excellent virtual conference. You know, I don't know if it came through uh, uh, earlier with Durhan's kickoff, but she is really hoping to get a lot of us together in person in Ottawa um, or at some point in Q1 of next year. And now we all know Rare Disease Day is at the end of February. Um, the, the timeline to, to, and, the, uh, and the pressure to do that is that the, the, the $500 million is, is going to be started to be spent on April 1st, 2022. Uh, so that's been in budget since 2019. So there is a lot of um, pressure to get all of these actionable ideas, fundable proposals together and forward and out there. So um, that's what today and tomorrow are about. Um, and that will build into a hybrid meeting in, in uh, probably in February. Uh, and ultimately we're looking at an April 1st uh, kickoff where where these things will actually um, start rolling out the door and, and getting funded, um, ideally. So I'm going to quickly walk through tomorrow. Thank you so much for the panel for 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 um, helping close out today. Any final thoughts, Fred? I, I think you want you want to throw something out. Um, look, I don't mean to take up, the, but one comment as talking about call to action, and again, looking to um, insight from Europe. Um, of, as we move into funding and an action plan that I think worked very well for them was their ability to put metrics to the key priorities, measure those metrics and publicize those metrics. So I think somebody talked about transparency. Uh, the best way to make all of us accountable for whatever role, whether you're a manufacturer, patient association, government, if we're in this together to make a better life for rare disease patients, because that's ultimately what we're, I think it's upon us to realize what do we want to measure and how do we do that? And then come back to making ourselves accountable to whether we met that or not. So that would be the last point that I would want to make as we get onto this journey, because otherwise it's a great, it's always a great discussion to look at innovative, creative and brainstorming. But I think once the dollars are on the table, how do we best measure the impact? Anyway, I just leave that thought uh, with, with the group and thank you so much for the invitation. And thanks Fred. And just a call out to the 2015 strategy. It has five pillars and 20 actions. It's not 
like it's not an east side mario's menu um it's not a tabla d'hote either like there are some things that you need to do but but that that's measurable you can actually look back at that and start putting some you know where have we come since 2015 and where do we need to go and just as a shout out of course newborn screening is there um better access pathways is, and and specified uh, evaluation methods are there so and to, to your call out for europe too two things one that was built on the uk strategy for rare disorders in terms of a a concept in a federation model where everyone can get around it but second, I think you're saying that instead of having this uh, conference in Ottawa, we have to actually go to Europe and have it there. So thank you, Fred, for that suggestion. Looking forward to uh, to Rome uh, in, in February. So I appreciate that. Uh, Fred will, will, will get us all there. Um, okay, um, I'm going to share my screen just to remind people of what we're going to do tomorrow. Uh, and then we'll have you on your way. I will have my lunch. Uh, and I appreciate Angela, you going off screen uh, for, for doing that. I'm sure some people are like me too. Um, so tomorrow uh, we're gonna we're gonna come back with some learnings from day one, uh, which Durhan and I will will walk through. Platform three is going to talk about creative and innovative financing pathways, um, and we're gonna we're gonna start with a uh, presentation and a discussion by um, by Rosalie Wyanch from from the CD Howe Institute, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, the next panel or the platform and the final platform of the day will be how to implement meaningful and representative patient engagement throughout the drug system in every area at every level um, in the rare disease drug agency or drug program, uh, whatever we end up uh, actually calling it. And actually, you know, the neat thing about this one is we're going to hear from people um, who have experience uh, building the patient centric model. Uh, and I know Maureen is, is, is really getting involved with some very neat things that are that are already happening that can that can actually form the Lego blocks of, of this strategy. And um, our friend David Page from the Canadian Hemophilia Society um, has, has, you know, a, a long history of building these systems for um, for blood disorders. So I'm going to give you back five minutes in the day. Um, Thank you, everybody, for, for, for coming. We had 99 people uh, participating uh, today. Hope everyone comes back tomorrow. Um, any thoughts that you have overnight or tomorrow morning in the shower, uh, you know, bring those light bulbs uh, with you tomorrow. Put them in the chat group. Put your hand up. We're looking for participation. Um, and pretend we are in person because, um, you know, I think I'm hopeful that at least next year we will be uh getting back together and i can properly see everybody so with that um thanks very much have a great day and and we'll see you uh tomorrow wherever you are bye-bye